anyone on the record? So with that, I will turn it over to Director McGallis, our finance chair. Will the secretary please call the roll? Director Anderson? Here. Director Anderson is calling in. He has completed the necessary paperwork. Thank you very much. Director Colson? Here. Director DeWitt? Director DeWitt? You're not here. Okay. Director Cotel? Here. Director Lewis? Here. Director Melvin? Here. Director Troiani? Director McGallis. Here. We have a quorum of six present and two absent, with one of the present being via telephone. If the record would also show that, Directors Frega, Higgins, Hobson, Pang, Ross, and Chairman Dillard are all also present. Thank you. Item number two is approval of minutes from uh, October 19, 2017. Are there any questions or comments? If not, uh, could we have a, a motion to approve? Um, moved by Director Melvin, second by uh, Director Lewis. Roll call. Director Anderson? Yes. Director Colson? Yes. Director Cotel? Yes. Director Lewis? Yes. Director Melvin? Yes. Director McGallis? Aye. Six ayes and two absent. Thank you. Uh, item 3A is a presentation of the quarterly performance report. Jessica? Morning, Director Matt Gallus and members of the Finance Committee. I will be presenting performance results through third quarter 2017. We provide this report on a quarterly basis at the same time that you are reviewing quarterly budget results to certify that the service boards are in substantial accordance with their budget. The performance comparisons in this report are year to date through third quarter compared with the performance of the prior year 2016. First, let's look at system-wide ridership performance. Using data from the National Transit Database, the NTD, we can see year-to-date right regional ridership results over the past 15 years. Compared to 2003, year-to-date ridership through September 2017 was 2% 2 higher. However, through third quarter 2017, we see a ridership decrease of 3.3% compared to year-to-date 2016, a difference of 15.1 million trips. So it looks as though 2017 will be our region's fifth consecutive year of decreased ridership. This chart shows RTA system year-to-date ridership by mode through third quarter 2017 represented by the blue bars. The orange dot within each bar represents the peer average ridership performance for that mode. As you can see, our region's fixed route and ADA paratransit modes performed roughly equal to or better than our peers. Starting from the left, CTA bus ridership is down 4.3% compared to 2016, and rail ridership dropped 3.3%. Those bus ridership losses were somewhat favorable compared to peers, who had an average loss of 7.5%, while heavy rail ridership losses were roughly equal to the peer average. In the middle now, metro ridership was down 1.4%, roughly equal to the peer average. Pace bus, the one positive thing, showed a 0.9% ridership increase to the third quarter of 2017, whereas each of its peers reported lower ridership compared to 2016 for an average 4.1% loss. Van Pool experienced steeper losses, ending the third quarter 9.7% below 2016, a much steeper decline compared to its peer average of negative 4%. ADA paratransit ridership in decreased by 0.9%, which is comparable to peer performance. Here's a look at peer ridership for the third quarter of 2017 compared to 2016. Each region has reported lower ridership through the third quarter of 2017 compared to the same period for 2016. This is using the same peer metropolitan areas that we use in our annual peer review. The Chicago region ranks sixth of the 10 regions with a 3.3% ridership decrease. On this chart, we're now looking at a few service and financial measures. Performance through the third quarter has some favorable performance for four measures shown by green arrows, along with two red arrows showing unfavorable performance. There was an increase in service provided to customers as shown by the green arrows for both vehicle revenue hours and vehicle revenue miles. CTA rail and PACE fixed route bus were the key drivers in these changes with rail hours up 2.2% and PACE bus hours up 9.2% compared to 2016. In the middle now, regional operating costs after being adjusted for inflation were up 0.9%. Higher operating costs were offset by the increase in vehicle revenue hours, producing an operating cost per vehicle revenue hour that was about $2 or 1.2% lower compared to 2016. 
The operating cost per passenger trip was $4.45, which is 4.3% or 18 cents unfavorable compared to 2016. This results from the combination of two unfavorable inputs, higher operating costs and lower ridership. Fare revenue per passenger trip was up 2.6% or 4 cents and seems to be a positive result. However, as we reported in prior quarterly report this year, both of the inputs for this measure were unfavorable. Fair revenue through the qu third quarter of the year was down 0.7%, a difference of about 5.5 million. Ridership, as seen on the previous slide, was also down. So although the end result is favorable, it would be preferable to reach that favorable result by gaining ridership and, of course, improving revenue. Last but not least, the fair recovery ratio, as shown here, reflects the ratio of fair revenue to operating expense without any credits or exclusions. A recovery ratio of 30... The recovery ratio of 36.2% is 1.3 percentage points lower compared to 2016, which is an unfavorable result. That concludes my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Director Melvin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. One, one quick question here. On, on Pace Bus, what are, what, are we, what are we to make of that, that, that that's the only one that, that had an increase? What are we, what's the takeaway there, please? Uh, well, we'll hear from Pace a little bit later, um, but uh, we're thinking that it's probably results from some of the new service that they rolled out on I-90 um, and some of the express bus service that they're working on. They've added new service, and so they see some ridership increases. And is th th that sort of a statistical anomaly because of the comparisons, or is it that this is a very popular and desirable service? I mean, I guess that's the question. Okay. Well, it, this, is a this is a comparison year to date up through third quarter. So um, it will reflect, the end of the year results will reflect more of that, wh whether that was a very popular service or not. Um, but up through third quarter anyway, through which they've introduced those new services, they're up. So hopefully TJ can share more with us later. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. On the pace ridership, you've broken it out from bus and van pool. When you put them together, what does that look like? You know, van pool has a very, a much smaller number of people, so it would have a very small effect on their overall ridership if we combine the two of them. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So while van pool itself went down, it didn't affect pace ridership overall as much as the, the other mode that they operate. Thank you. Okay, no other comments. Uh, at this point, I want to move uh, to item 3C. Uh, we have all the service boards here, and we can come back to 4A and 3B after that presentation. Um, so 3C is a presentation and discussion of the 2018 budgets of the CTA, Metro, and PACE. And I just as, as, uh, take the opportunity to, to thank uh, B and, and the RTA staff and Lan and everybody for the great work they've done on the budget and even more so the service boards with the tremendous uh, uh, amount of money that we were looking at as far as having to uh, come up with that either fell short because of the state or other for other reasons. Uh, you've done a fantastic job in what I've seen uh, in the documents that have been submitted and you're to be congratulated. There are tough decisions to be made. Uh, some boards are raising fares that haven't been raised for many years, which is a tough decision, but uh, one that um, I'm really glad to see that has been addressed. Others have uh, taken the first time ever to um, make actual service cuts. Uh, so that's a tough, it's been a tough year, and I think the service boards uh, and staffs have really stepped up to that challenge. Uh, with that, B, uh, let's move to the uh, budget presentation of the CTA, I guess, is first. So, uh, no, actually, um, well, a couple of things. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, today we'll be presenting the RTA agency budget, Metro, CTA, and PACE, and PACE ADA. Uh, you will not be voting um, on these consolidated budgets until December 14. Um, I do want to commend uh, Tom, Jeremy, and Rocky and their finance teams, uh, again, for a very collaborative process. I mean, you know, this is, this is the heavy lifting that has to get done periodically, and these are not easy choices. Uh, particularly fare increases and, and in some cases service reductions, uh, but it's what's necessary to produce uh, not only the statutorily required re uh, recovery ratio, but it is also what is necessary to produce uh, balanced budgets. Um, the order we're following today, we always give uh, the new people uh, the, the, the last slot. So we're starting with Metro, then we'll do CTA, and, and then we'll do PACE. And then um, afterwards, uh, Director McGallis, as you indicated, um, we will do the RTA agency budget, 
and then I guess we'll do the 2017 financial results. Uh, so we're going to switch up the order here. We're going to have Metro first. Okay, good. Um, so uh, I'd like to welcome to the podium um, Director Arsino and uh, Tom Farmer, and I guess Lynette. Actually, they'll be here. And Jim. And Jim. Sorry. Jim. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, Chairman and uh, RTA board members. Uh, once again, it's that time of the year to come and explain our budget and talk about some of the things we've done, some of the pitfalls we had, where we're going, and how we got there, and some of the things we're planning into the future as far as it goes to the budget. Um, this year, I'd, I'd like to uh, present Lynette Silverella, who's been up here before. Lynette is our Senior Division Director of Capital Planning, Tom Farmer, our CFO. And <clears throat> this is Jim Derwinski. Many of you know him, many of you don't. I'm going to be retiring at the end of the year. Jim's going to take the helm as of January 1st, 2018. And uh, Jim has been around the railroad, uh, the Metro Railroad, for 21 years. He had several years on the Chicago Northwestern before that. And prior to that, he was an electrician in nuclear submarines. So uh, very knowledgeable. He's uh, built a good team, and, and the board unanimously voted him in, so we've got all the confidence in the world. What I would like to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Jim, uh, let him go through the budget with you, and, and we'll be prepared to answer any questions that you have. Uh, Jim, you want to go ahead and start? Thank you. Um, I'll take you through the uh, 2018 numbers with a little bit of detail as we move forward through the uh, presentation. Uh, this year we uh, present a balanced budget as normal. Um, we're going to meet our recovery ratio as um, directed. Uh, the funding shortfalls are going to be um, taken care of with our, our, excuse me, they have the rising cost uh, due to the disappointing uh, tax sales from the state and um, the um, um, latest, uh, excuse me, the latest um, cut we had. Um, the actions that we're going to take to balance the budget this year are going to reduce a small number of trains by cutting them. As you indicated, this is the first time we've ever had to do this. Um, we're also going to be re raising fares, and we'll, we'll be raising fares a quarter. We'll talk about that in a second. The capital program uh, key components this year include, as last year, the uh, PTC rolling stock and, and bridges. Um, this is taking a look at what our 2017 versus 2018 budgets look like. The uh, budget itself is down to 994 compared to last year, and that's because we didn't get the um, additional capital this year, 6.3% down. This is our operating budget, taking a look at the $45 million gap at the top. It's $30 million due to the rising cost. That's primarily due to labor. Well, we'll get into that in a second. Our sales tax numbers are $2 million low, and the state funding cuts $13 million. So the $30 million, uh, like I said, most of it's the labor, $23 million there. Materials and other uh, necessities to run the railroad have uh, taken care of that. The only place we see any type of um, uh, positive number is in the fuel cost, and uh, we're only um, estimating a $1 million savings there because they've been kind of consistent. Um, in the 2017 numbers, we were projected to get 430 million. We actually are getting 405 million, so that gives us a delta there. Uh, that's really putting putting us in the position that we had to make these these uh, decisions. The operating budget. The operating budget. Um, we're going to be once again reducing spending by 14 million. Cutting a small number of trains, that'll be uh, saving us $3 million. That includes some of the cuts we've already made in 2017. Raising fares will get us $17 million. And then $20 million is all we're going to be able to put into the capital program. We had to reduce that by $12 million, so we're deferring that long-term investment. And we've also identified $2 million in other funding. The breakdown of the efficiencies and the cost actions are personnel actions where we're basically freezing positions and uh, holding some positions. That's going to get us three million. We saw our four million. Excuse me. We saw three million through the uh, IT and telecom and 
A lot of that has to do with our new ERP system. Other actions are, are minor there to the point of the, the service actions, and that's, that's where we're going to talk about the actual uh, reducing uh, or eliminating trains. These are the trains that are currently being proposed to eliminate. Um, this will be done February 5th, um, so it's 11 months of elimination. Um, North Central Service, we had um, some trains that had skip stops that were very close to each other. We um, eliminated one inbound and one outbound train. That, uh, that allows us also to eliminate a crew. That's where the real savings comes in. You have the fuel cost. So what we're going to do is um, move the two adjacent trains just a little bit, uh, add a few minutes on one end, and then put some extra cars in there so the riders won't be impacted by that other than the time. Southwest service, that's a minor move. That one just saves fuel and miles for the, um, for the um, engineer and the crew. Rock Island, on the, on the weekday, we're eliminating uh, some evening trains, and that's going to eliminate a crew as well. All of these trains that we're talking about for the elimination on the Rock Island had very, very low ridership. On the Milwaukee District North, we're eliminating Saturday service on four trains and Sunday service on two trains. That's actually returning us to a 2006 weekend service level. Once again, those actually eliminate crews, and that's where you get the savings. Estimated savings with all of the service actions is $3 million. The fare increases, which generate $17 million, are $0.25 cents across the board um, as it's uh, calculated into the different multipliers. Uh, we also move the 10 ride from a 90% value to a 95% now. We'll re recapture 95% of 10 rides. And the monthly pass, we move the multiplier from 28 and a half to 29 and the weekend pass moved from 8 to $10. All of that, we believe, is going to capture a $17 million more than revenue. Um, on the expense side, you can see it's going to be 797.2. Um, that's basically what we need to, to run the railroad. The, on the um, revenue side coming in, we're looking at 411 with the revenues. The sales tax, once again, at 405. And uh, we got a little bit of security money in there, so that puts us at 817. Um, and you see down at the bottom that we actually uh, are only doing $20 million in a capital fare box. So that was supposed to be 32, and that's where we actually pulled back in to get in, into budget. So on the capital side, we know that over the next 10 years, the numbers are $12 billion of our state of good repair needs to maintain and to catch up our state of good repair needs. That's about $1.2 billion a year over the next 10 years. So if we take a look at uh, that side and saying that's $1.2 billion, this is actually what we're anticipating getting in for capital this year from the federal side and, and RTA. The state, obviously, at this point in time does not have a capital bill uh, coming our way. And what that does then is it puts us in a position where we're obviously with our $20 million on top of that, uh, that a great mm -hmm. shortfall. So with that very precious capital dollars, we can go through a little bit of what we're going to spend that on. It's, once again, uh, when you add the numbers together, it comes up to about 196 or rough, almost 200 million. Once again, 1.2 billion would be the ideal number that we'd be looking at for the next 10 years. Um, the breakdown is a majority going into rolling stock. And then we have our, our track and our electrical system, which is really part of the PTC system facilities and then um, just your necessary parking and, and uh, support activities. And you can see there's a, a five-year projection here, and they all pretty much track the same with the bulk of the capital money that's forecast to come in going into the rolling stock. Uh, major capital projects specifically for next year, um, the rail car rehabilitation, we're doing that in two of our facilities. Uh, this year we did 43 cars, and this, this should take care of 43 cars for next year. Locomotive rehabilitation, we're doing that in uh, Georgia, and we're doing that in Chicago in-house. We anticipate with the dollars we're going to get, we're going to get 16 to 18. This year we forecast at 17. We have put $23 million in for new car purchases. That really doesn't buy us a lot of cars. Over half the fleet right now is well over 30 years old. Our oldest car next year hits Medicare age at 65 years old. Um, bridges, putting some money into the bridges, and then positive train control. This should take us almost to the finish line of a $400 million unfunded mandate. On uh, the um, ICE money coming in from the RTA, $3 million is going to our uh, GPS train tracking system. We, in, we anticipate that there will be a great enhancement for the, the passengers once that rolls out, but that's probably just not going to even 
fill the whole bucket on that one. We definitely uh, need a replacement there. And there's a lot of good opportunities looking at possibly uh, automatic passenger counters and some other options there, putting those actually on the trains. LED conversion on our Amrail cars save us a little bit of energy, and then the life expectancy of the LEDs should last rehab to rehab. And then downtown terminals, we're enhancing our displays. Um, the customer initiatives that they're going to see right up front, well, on-time performance-wise, we're working very hard to finish our 33rd straight month in a row above 95, clearly above our peers. Um, today we had a little blip, so we'll see how the, the rest of the month goes. Um, revenue, um, excuse me, service reviews, and so that's going to be ongoing. Um, unfortunately, this was the first year that we ever had to cut service, but I believe now in looking at our service, every six months or so, we are going to start looking at all of the, the lines, looking at the ridership, and looking at the, at the business to see whether or not we should not just wait till a budget time to cut service, but to actually start looking at further cuts of service. Currently, right now, um, we, we definitely are planning on getting back some of that the state money from the PTF. If that doesn't come in, we already have uh, planned service cuts in mid-year next year. Hopefully that's all we would have to do. Um, train inspections, we have a team of people that goes out there and really tries to make sure that the trains, the stations, and the crews are, are doing what they're all supposed to do. And it's really kind of helping. Um, it helps us have another set of eyes out there. Mobile ticketing. It's been uh, enhanced and it's going very well. We're well into the 30s now with the mobile ticket. Um, and the stations that we're working on in 17, we also have some stations that are going to come online um, in, in 18, including Romeoville. It's actually almost done. Lockport next year is going to be coming online. We're starting the, the project on the North Line Bridges, 44 bridges total in the project. We're going to be doing the starting of a, the second 11 next year. UP West on the main line, we're going to be triple tracking all the way out there. Um, that's in a partnership with the state. That project's going to take a couple of years, but we uh, did groundbreaking a few about a month ago. Once again, we are rehabbing the cars in house, and that's uh, providing uh, you know a better product for the uh, reliability of service. Reliability of service, and uh, we just rolled out our strategic plan uh, for the first time. Our board approved it last month, and so that uh, we've got four. Uh, what we call short-term goals in there, uh, looking at the five-year plan because of the fact that we're very well aware of the fact that funding right now doesn't allow us really to be looking at big uh, long-term goals. And also, uh, we're doing a fair structure study. Um, we're doing cost-benefit analysis on, on our existing service and station optimization. All three of those tools are going to help us really look at our fares in the future. And then uh, finally, the, the summary is, uh, without adequate uh, steady continued funding for the operation and our capital, uh, we're facing some serious challenges. It's, it's unsustainable at this point in time. We see that clearly that um, the uh, tax revenues coming in are on a decline, and we, we know that fuel prices are vulnerable, and we know that ridership has been declining. So we clearly are on a path right now um, for financial uh, trouble. And um, what Jim was talking about, when we talked about the service cuts and, and looking at the service every year, it's not just to look at cuts, it's to better align the trains that we do have to increase service, to increase the benefit for our riders. I'll give you a perfect example on the south side this year on the Metro Electric District. We had a couple of our branch lines off of the electric that were underperforming. <laughs> And you had Hyde Park, which was exploding. So what we were able to do is repurpose a lot of that equipment and crews and have a better, more robust service where the people are at, understanding when those other areas come back and they develop and things happen and ridership changes, we will add service back into those areas. But it's not just to look at what we can cut because we really don't want to be cutting. We want to be adding service and providing a better service with the network, uh, you know, Pace Metro and the CTA. But we need help. We, we definitely need help, and, and you can look at the numbers and see where we're at. It's, it's not in a good position. And we looked at, you know, the RTA. When the RTA was formed back in the 70s, uh, the Rock Island, uh, Milwaukee Road, all the railroads that were going bankrupt, and that's the whole reason why we're here today as we are. No one supported that system, and there wasn't money. It, it can get back there, and it's much more costly to bring it back to life when you get down so far. So our... We, we just need help. We need help from everybody to try to make sure our legislators and everybody knows that this is unsustainable.
If we could, um, I, one of the things we want to start with each of the service boards is if you would provide us a little bit of background on your public hearings and what the input you receive from the public concerning either operations or capital, uh, <coughs> especially when you've got another year of uh, where you're having to raise uh, fares and also make some minor reductions in service. Sure, I'll, I'll provide an update. So we had a total of um, eight public hearings. One were held in each of the counties. We had 39 total individuals that provided testimony at those eight public um, meetings, as well as 304 comments came in through a variety of other sources, um, including email, uh, Facebook, Twitter, telephone, fax, and our special um, on the by level, we had an issue where you could fill out comments and, and get it back to us. So when you look at all of those comments we received, they centered on a handful of different themes. Number one was the appreciation that we did scale back the reduced per fare proposal. We had a proposal to eliminate um, the uh, monthly ticket as well as only offer the reduced fare at certain times of day. So we did uh, get some comments related to that. There were concerns um, regarding the elimination of service. Um, there was the opposition to the fare increase. We had some general service suggestions related to our on-time performance, uh, equipment failures, and some of the crowded cr train conditions that some people experience. There was a need or a, a desire for us to renew and upgrade our trains, our stations, our platform, and our general infrastructure. And we did have a number of people who acknowledged that public funding is falling short of um, the levels that we need to maintain our system. Thank you. Uh, this time I, we'll open it up for questions and, and comments. Uh, anyone have a question? Yes, Director Lewis. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of questions and I'll ask this of all three service agencies. Uh, the first question would be, do you have a point of view on alternative funding sources? I know you uh, mentioned that the funding is not sustainable, so do you have any thoughts on what um, options might be available for funding beyond the ones we have now? Well, there's there's a lot of a lot of things we're looking at. We're looking at you know non-revenue based funding, not fair based funding. We're looking at advertising and things like that. But the unfortunate thing with Metro is we're only in the city for X amount of time, and then as we radiate out from the hub, we go out to areas like McHenry, you go out to Elgin, you go out to Joliet. There's far less people that view those trains. You've seen some of our trains. I hope with the train wraps, uh, you know they've got you know different things on there. But really, if you were in the urban area where you had millions of people looking at, there'd be much more of a demand for that. We're also looking at where we can put advertising in the stations, but a lot of the stations we don't own, which a lot of people don't know that, and there's a lot of communities that do not want advertising in the stations. So we're, process we're in the process of working with those communities to let them know that you know, we can put service alerts, we can do things. We'd like to move into the digital age where we can do service announcements, where we can do other things, and then also supplement that with advertising. We're also looking at TODs, uh, working with villages. New Lenox has got a, a huge TOD in the process of going on right now. Um, those types of things where you can get the development close, get ridership on the trains, and, and that will help. Um, our real ridership is going to come, and in, in this is as far as I can see, it's having trains that arrive at your destinations in a lot less time. In order to do that, you have to have the infrastructure to do it. The Burlington Northern, for instance, has three main lines. You can run a true express service, Kirk. You ride that line just about every day, and when you hop on one of those trains and you're 30 minutes to get downtown from Naperville, that's pretty good. We started something about a year and a half ago on the Rock Island where it had 400 and some people. I think last I checked, it was over 1,300 people on a 457 train. Um, you know, because when you get on the train, 31 minutes, you're at Tinley Park, 80th Avenue. You'd have to have a rocket to get out there in a car, and trust me, you're not, it's not going to happen. So those are the things that we need to look at, but those don't come with small price tags. We're putting an additional less than 10 miles worth of track on the UP West Line. That's over a $100 million investment. So, you know, you're, when you look at those things, the capital intensity on our budgets and everything else that we have, that's, so we are looking at those things to answer your question. The second and final question would be, um, relative, last year we talked about uh, DBE participation and trying to work with um, um, uh, a variety of suppliers and vendors. How do you stand relative to that particular initiative? Has there been progress or um, uh, achieving the goals in that area? 
No, we're, we're doing very well in that area, and we're growing our DBE pool all the time. Actually, uh, the person that we have running that is, uh, we do three main events a year. We do one very, very big event, but um, we give awards. We do a lot of different things. We try to get people out. We do workshops with our people. We do them in 547, our headquarters. We also go out and work in, in different areas to try to build up the, uh, the DBE pool and, and minority business pool. So, And then we also have a set-aside. We for Last year, we had a set-aside for the smaller contracts and everything else, and we've also looked at unbundling so there is more DBE participation. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to have a question about operating expenses. So they're projected to go up 4.2 percent, which is, as I understand, the largest of any of the service boards and about twice of what inflation is projected to be for 2018 by most sources. So could you help us understand what drives um, the increase in operating expenses for Metra, and if the answer is labor, which I think it is based on what you've already said, why are those pressures greater for Metra than they would be for the other service boards? If you look at our costs budget to budget, which is really the way we look at them, budget to budget we're going up 1.9%. Um, we had some certain underruns this year due to mild winter and other one-time events, but if you actually look budget to budget, we're going up 1.9%, which is below the rate of inflation. In the year before that, we went up budget to budget 0.9%, um, which was also below the rate of inflation. So for the last two years, our budget to budget moves have been lo lower than the rate of inflation. Can, can I also add one thing to that to answer your question? Um, several things that are happening out there that, that I'm sure you're not or might not be familiar with. One of the things, we had a $400 million unfunded mandate called positive train control. It's a safety overlay system. We had to hire, I would say, about 150 to 170 people to install that system. That system, once it's installed, is going to take additional maintenance people. We figure about 15 to $20 million a year. It's costing us more money to maintain older cars, older equipment, that you wouldn't have those costs if you had newer equipment and things like that. The second thing we're doing, since we didn't have a large capital pot to buy new cars, we're increasing our throughput on our, our shops where we're actually rebuilding the cars in-house in the city of Chicago in the six-county area. We're doing it for about 650 to 700,000 per car versus sending those cars out, out of state, losing those tax dollars to, that work for you. So we're getting a huge increase in the benefit of what it's providing for the six county area, and we're building those cars in-house. And I would invite anybody to come down. We could get a tour to take a look and see what we do. We've had several congressmen and senators and everybody else come down and look at it, and they are in amazement and awe of what we can do rebuilding those cars. So those are some of the operation expenses that we have. So just to follow up, so budget to budget, um, your growth is less than inflation, but as compared to 2017, actual projected, it would exceed inflation. So it, it seems then um, you're probably anticipating that during, during 2018 calendar year that expenses would actually come down relative to budget. Is this? <clears throat> we always budget to trend. So... In 2017, we benefited from a mild winter. In 2017, we budgeted from, or we uh, we anticipated some of the service cuts that were coming, as you see here, and so we cut back on some of our training classes, apprentice classes, and that sort of thing, understanding that we were going to have less um, less need for additional manpower in 2018. So the reason it's going up is because 2017 was lower than trend, not because 2018 is going higher. So what you're seeing 2016, 17, 18 is a fairly slow, steady growth in our budgeted levels. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Director Coles. Sir, your, um, your capital budget is pretty much debt free, is that fair to say? We, we do not uh, engage in any borrowing at this point in time to fund our capital budget. And what, uh, what were the results of your uh, review of the various reduced fares? I think you mentioned that you looked at it, but well, how did that come out? Um, it, it wasn't a, a look. It was one of the proposals that was sent in, uh, to the board in September. So in September, we presented the board with a variety of different ways to balance out the debt that the shortfall, the $45 million. One of those was to uh, eliminate the monthly reduced fare pass. 
um, and then scale back the validity of the um, one way and the 10 ride that they would no longer be available during the AM peak period. So you would need to pay full fare, which is scaling it back to the actual legislative um, kind of mandate. We've always had a, a broader reduced fare policy. Um, that discussion took place in September um, when we presented um, materials between September and October. The board said that they were not interested <coughs> in using that, that particular um, way of balancing out. So Tom and I went back and, and cranked the pencils a little bit more and, and came back with a different proposal, which is a proposal that um, was presented in October, went out for public comment, and um, the board uh, approved that was presented today. Lastly, on these uh, service cuts, uh, service cuts on the line to Antioch and the Milwaukee North Line, you might want to figure out a way to see how much service goes up on your UP North Line on weekends because anecdotally, I know the people in my area are going to drive to Wilmette and they can't get a timely train to Chicago on weekends. So you may uh, save a lot of costs here and uh, not lose much ridership. You might want to monitor that in some way. We, we will definitely monitor that, and we're also looking at uh, – the UP, this next go around and everything else. But one thing I want to add about the service cuts, we built our, our 2018 budget with the understanding that the state was going to come back and restore the 10 percent, you know, um, cost that they, they took away. So if, if that does not happen, I, I want to be very clear. So you're not hearing one thing, and if we have to do something midterm, um, we are going to have to go back and, and look at some unfortunate options again. Don or Jim, um, PTC, after it's fully implemented, how many permanent employees is it going to take to keep that system up? It's undetermined at this time. We're actually watching Metrolink out in L.A. and, and the kind of uh, needs that they have. Um, roughly, we've estimated it's going to be about 20 to 25 million, but that includes all the licensing and all the uh, – the radio frequency purchasing and all that kind of stuff. Um, Employees-wise, we've kind of thrown out a ballpark number of probably about 50. Um, just a, a couple other thoughts. The more you can advertise through the on the byline or or any other way to your to your riders um, that they need to check with their employers whether they can take the transit benefit program. Um, you know, people talk to me as, as fares change. Um, and I always ask them, do you, you know, and these are people that work for major companies or large law firms or accounting firms. Do you take the transit benefit or do you available, you see, avail yourself of the transit benefit program? And it's incredible how many say no. Uh, I asked one the other day, why don't you? Because I just don't have time to fill out the paperwork. And I tell them, look, you can save e enormous amounts of money on your fares if you take the transit benefit program. So the more you can let riders know uh, that they ought to check with their employers and, and they can go to the RTA website. We've got something uh, that will walk them through whether or not they can do that or not, um, you know, the, the better off uh, that you are. Um, just, a, just a couple of general thoughts, too. The more we can let folks know um, that they, you know, with all the pressures that are out there, uh, including what's happening with fares, it still costs, on average, if you're a Metro rider, $11,000 a year more to take an automobile to work than it does to ride Metro. Uh, that is an incredible, incredible amount of money. Uh, and the more we can, you know, harp the transit benefit program, let people know they save $11,000 a year or could if they dump the pump uh, and take Metra. And to some extent, even the CTA gives incredible savings as well. Um, we need to, to have that out there. And then, you know, to, to Director Higgins question, I mean, old equipment um, has operating costs. Uh, and we're clearly seeing, you know, an, an increased need for personnel to take care of 65-year-old cars. Uh, and um, one of the things that I, I think is really commendable of you is that you, you know, your, your rail yard operation where you rehab these cars is incredible. 
uh, and granted there might be an extra person or two on the payroll, but when you look at how much money uh, we save, that the equipment is better, more reliable, but that money remains in the state of Illinois as opposed to going out of the state of Illinois, um, I just think is, is, a, is a real important story. And then last but not least, um, our gasoline tax in this state is among the bottom 10 in America uh, that goes for infrastructure. So we are supposed to be the transportation hub of this country, but yet what goes from the state gasoline tax, which has been untouched since 1990, is among the 10 lowest in America. And Indiana just went to 13 cents under their conservative governor, or increased it 13 cents. Iowa increased theirs. Um, but our motor fuel tax, Jim, when you're, when you're taking over for Don, when you're seeing those legislators, I don't think most of them realize uh, that uh, the state of Illinois um, is, is among the bottom 10 of the gas tax that goes to infrastructure. And uh, I just read in the Tribune two days ago uh, that only three other states in America have, uh, have gone as long as Illinois without any adjustment for inflation uh, to their motor fuel tax. I mean, it has about half or 55% of the buying power it did in 1990. Uh, when it was last uh, last changed, and with uh, electric cars and other things, um, you know that number is even going to get lower and lower. But uh, um, that that's just uh, that's out there, and the more you can accentuate that to uh, my former colleagues in the legislature, because at, at some point in time, um, as the last sentence there says, if something doesn't change with respect to especially capital, um, we've got a, as your chairman. Deplie points out, I think he said this is the biggest crisis he's ever seen in his probably 40 years in the railroad industry. But thank you for your cooperation. Uh, Don, as much as we will miss you, um, Jim Derwinski's a, a very fine successor. I know you've worked with him, and uh, um, we just, on behalf of the RTA, thank you for your cooperation as we will thank Dorval and TJ and their staff as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. questions um, on the uh, overall budget one of the things that I guess more a com compliment than anything the uh, using operating uh, revenues now that you're getting from fares and so forth and applying some of that to capital you've started that a number of years ago and I think that's a great thing and it should be highlighted uh, for many years we're unable to do that and the other thing is uh, my understanding you're not utilizing any capital dollars to fund operation expenses and that, that is correct, and we will not be doing that. A major accomplishment from past years when we had massive cuts like you had to deal with this time. So you were able to overcome that by the amount of fare increase and, and some reduction in services. Um, I think that's great. The uh, last comment I had is that we did eliminate the 5% uh, reserve policy of this board having to uh, deal with having reserves available um, for unforeseen expenses. Certainly this year you had that challenge and you obviously were able to uh, deal with it. Uh, looking at 2018, there's, as you mentioned, Don, specifically there are, are some unknowns ahead of us yet. Uh, certainly the uh, re fair reimbursement uh, issue that's out there, um, we've got that in at the total amount. That would be about a million five to you if that doesn't come through. Um, looking at the PTF issue, that was another million four. So you're looking at like 2.9 just in that plus anticipated revenues that in other areas that could be a problem. So how will you use your your fund reserves? Or I know you're talking about you may have to look at additional service adjustments and so forth. How are you going to uh, be able to deal with some of these issues if they do develop mid-year? We've, we've already started working, as we said, once we – finished up the budget and the board passed it this time. Our, our challenge from the board was, because we they know all along that you know the state and, and us are on two different budget cycles. So if that does not come through in advance, we will know what we're going to be doing and we'll have to implement that very quickly in order not to you know fall behind. But 
Um, we're looking at it. We're hoping that doesn't happen. We're hoping everybody on the URT board and our board and everybody you talk to and through our by level, we're asking people to talk to our le legislators. We're asking people if you really think Metra is a worthwhile system, then you need to let people know how worthwhile it is because it's it's not getting better, it's getting worse. So to answer your question, the board will have a tough decision with some of the things that we'll present, and they're not done yet on probably either raising fares once again and service cuts. That's the only other way to, to, to get money on a, on a short-term type thing. We're doing other things, like I explained before. We're trying to you know work together with some of the communities on TODs. We're looking at how we can align service better to draw more ridership to it. We saw that on the electric district earlier this year I talked about. Whatever we can do, um, you know, without going to the rider and asking them once again to, to pay for something, uh, we're going to try to do it. But at the end of the day, you know, you got to balance sheet and you got to balance it. You got to you got to make sure you're running the business like a business. Glad to hear your response because obviously, I mean, you've done a great job on a budget that you've submitted, knowing full well though that you have some major challenges coming up in 18. I mean, we know we're going to have to deal with those. And I'm glad to hear that your board's going to be dealing with it. That'll, that'll be great for us. Uh, any other questions or comments? If not, uh, Don, I want to thank you, too. I, over the years, had the opportunity to work with you. You did an outstanding job, and you'll really be missed. And uh, I, you stepped up to the plate when we needed somebody that was strong, that was knowledgeable, and at a very difficult time. And you took uh, Metro and, and this board as well through that process, and you, you did an outstanding job. And, and I, I certainly will miss you, and I know as the chairman said, uh, we will all miss you. And I okay, I, I, I truly appreciate that. It's been an honor to serve on uh, as leader of Metra and also to coordinate things with the RTA and get to know everybody and also uh, Leanne and with Dorval and TJ. We've got a, an absolute wonderful relationship. It's very cooperative, much different than it was in past years. And when we go to Springfield and we go to Washington, D.C., that does not go unnoticed. It truly has been an honor to be here and, and work through a lot of the issues with you. Thank you. Okay, and now we'll be bringing up uh, President Carter. Um, Jeremy Fine and Michelle Curran. I think that's. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, for having us here, Chairman Margolis. Um, I want to I want to give a few remarks to sort of set up uh, Jeremy Fine's presentation uh, before we get into it. And I think you're going to hear CTA speaking to a lot of the same issues that you just heard Metro speak to, uh, with regards to both the remainder of 2017 as well as uh, next year's budget. Um, uh, but I also want to take a, a moment here to to both. Uh, thank and, and recognize the support and coordination that we've gotten from RTA as we've worked through our budget this year. Um, uh, this has been, in my personal experience, one of the most challenging budgets I've ever experienced. Um, uh, the combination of, of the, the state subsidy cuts, um, uh, ridership decline, um, uh, increased competition from other forces, disruptors as I like to call it in the industry have made putting together a budget that we feel is both balanced and reasonable in terms of assumptions a, a, a bigger challenge than normal. But I am pleased to tell you that we do have a budget that we have put together. It is, it is um, my proposal to our board that is balanced, uh, that does not have any service cuts in it, um, that does have a 25 cent fare increase, um, um, uh, but also uh, has significant reductions in expenses. In fact, um, Next year's budget is going to come in at $9.7 million less than this year's budget. Um, uh, I believe, in my experience, this is the first time CTA has ever proposed a budget that is actually less than the prior year's budget, absent service cuts. Uh, and I think that's an, an, a recognition of both the cost efficiencies and the other revenue enhancements 
the CTA has engaged in, um, not just for next year, but we've been engaging in over the last nine years, uh, which has allowed us to basically go nine years without a fare increase, which is the longest period of time for any major transit system in this country since 2009. Um, and we're proud of that fact. However, we also recognize that at a certain point in time, realities kick in, and there are certain things that we need to do uh, to address the, the requirements of the region and, and of CTA uh, to meet our statutory requirements for a balanced budget and, the, and to meet the fair recovery ratio. And so uh, it's with that understanding that we have moved forward with a proposal for a 25 cent fare increase. Uh, I also want to take a moment to, to, to mention briefly on the capital side. Um, we, we, face, we have a $2.7 billion capital program. Uh, the capital program continues to be much smaller than I think is rational for any agency of our size. Um, as you know, we have not had a state capital program since 2009. Uh, to put that in context, that's about $200 million a year for CTA in capital. Um, uh, it is very hard to maintain, much less improve a system of the size and age of CTA uh, with that type of uh, scenario. And uh, I've been very vocal uh, both recently and over the past couple of years about the fact that there's no excuse for a, a, a state of Illinois, for the state of Illinois uh, to go as long as it has gone without having a new capital program in place. Having said that, I think CTA has been very innovative in finding ways to find capital funds that go outside of the normal expectation of a state capital program. Uh, as you know, last year we got a uh, statutory authority to implement a TIF that allowed me to get over a billion dollars worth of funding for the Red Purple Modernization Project. Uh, I desperately needed uh, track renewal and, ca and capacity expansion project that uh, we're pursuing right now. And I'm pleased to say that the City Council uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, approved a new ride hailing fee uh, that is de being dedicated totally to transit capital. Um, that's going to bring in about $16 million a year uh, that we're going to be able to then leverage uh, to do some significant work in terms of additional track renewal and maintenance work as well as some security enhancements that we think are critical uh, to continuing to address customer concerns and to, to um, um, you know, try to turn around the trends on ridership uh, that we're seeing occur over the last few years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy and let him walk you through in more detail both uh, our 2017 uh, forecast as well as our 2018 budget, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that any of you may have uh, after his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dorval. <coughs> So the, uh, the 2018 operating budget, as Gorville outlined, is, um, is uh, $9.7 million uh, below the 2017 budget. Uh, and as Dorville highlighted, that, again, is, is probably one of the first times that that's happened uh, without uh, service cuts. So again, uh, a great testament to the fact that the CTA has undertaken, uh, you know, very efficient uh, operations, uh, including, you know, reducing our operating costs, uh, and increasing other revenues, and we'll get into that more in a moment. Uh, but the $300 million uh, of savings that we've been able to attain uh, since 2011 has allowed us to forego, uh, you know, the fare increases that we're talking about here today. Um, we've been able to achieve, uh, you know, again, that $300 million through a combination of both expense cuts and also non-fare box revenue enhancements in the form of advertising revenues and concession revenues and the like. Uh, over $100 million of that uh, $300 million in savings has come under uh, Dorval's tenure. So again, um, that's a real testament to the fact that we were able to pick uh, low-hanging fruit early, but we've also been able to sustain uh, those expense reductions uh, over the last several years as well. Uh, the 2018 budget includes uh, cuts uh, to labor uh, to the tune of about $12.5 million. Uh, fuel and power costs have been reined in, almost $5 million. Uh, we've been able to hold the line on contractual expenses and also improve our advertising revenue by over $3 million. Uh, but this has all been done in an in increasingly challenging uh, fiscal environment. Uh, state budget, uh, as we've been talking about here today, uh, you know, the operating uh, hit that we took here at the CTA uh, was $33 million for 2018. Uh, that's a combination of the 2% cut on the sales tax as well as the 10% cut on the PTF 
uh, you know, accrues up to $33 million for 2018. Uh, and the capital bill, uh, you know, the fact that we've not had a capital bill has, uh, you know, seen state funding for capital been reduced by about $200 million a year. So again, a, a big hit both on the operating side and on the capital side. That's all in the face of uh, continued uh, competition on the ridership. Uh, we see that uh, driven predominantly from low gas prices. Uh, low gas prices incentivize people to get in their cars, uh, and whether that's a personal vehicle or a rideshare vehicle. Uh, but again, low gas prices have, have, have been um, you know, a headwind that we faced, as well as uh, you know, just the, the general congestion that comes around more people on the road. <clears throat> We're proposing the first fare increase uh, since 2009 for the base fare. Uh, the base fares would go up a quarter, uh, so bus would go from two dollars to two and a quarter. Uh, bus cash would go from 225 to 250. Uh, rail would go from 225 to 250 as well. And then the only pass that we're looking to increase, uh, as proposed, is the hundred dollar uh, 30 day pass going up to 105 dollars. Uh, the way that we came up with the hundred Five is that you know it's two rides a day, 25 cents uh, per direction, uh, times 21 days in the year, in the uh, month uh, is the five dollars. But again, that is a real bargain uh, in terms of allowing people to ride uh, during the work week uh, to and from work, and they get the work or they get the weekends for free. Uh, so that ratio still maintains itself, uh, and in fact improves a little bit. Reduced fares. Uh, would maintain the 50% uh, ratio that they currently are at. Uh, so bus would go up uh, from a dollar to a dollar ten, and rail would go up uh, to a dollar twenty-five. Would go up by fifteen cents. All other fares and passes, as well as student fares, would remain the same. And um, you know, so that kind of closes out the operating side. On the capital side, as Dorval highlighted, uh, we have a new ride-hailing fee in the form of the ground transportation tax. Uh, and that is solely dedicated to capital. Uh, so that helps plug the hole uh, that the state has not been filling on the capital funding side. <coughs> uh, outlined on the next page is our 2018 uh, proposed operating budget. And again, you see um, the overall expenses going down, almost $10 million for the year. Uh, included in that is the actual labor line going down as well. Uh, so you see all of our lines, um, you know, basically going down materials, uh, as Metra had highlighted, uh, materials are going up just because uh, as, um, you know, some of our rail cars and buses come off of warranty, uh, there's a, a slight increase there. But again, we've been very uh, diligent in sharpening our pencils to ensure that the, uh, the various line items of the budget uh, are tracking downward. Uh, we have a very diversified and growing revenue base. Um, you know, we obviously, uh, you know, rely uh, predominantly on uh, state funding and fare box, but we have been able to build uh, other non-fare box revenues. Uh, our advertising and concession revenues uh, for 2018 will almost be $40 million. Uh, so we've been very fortunate in being able to build on the successes uh, and continue to grow the successes of the uh, platform ads and the street panels that we've installed throughout the system. <clears throat> Ridership trends and impacts, as I highlighted, uh, have had uh, some headwinds for us on, on the overall ridership. Uh, but you know we we continue. Thank you. We continue to track uh, within the you know 15 year band of ridership. So if you look at ridership over a longer term period, uh, you know we are still within that bandwidth. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're sitting on our laurels. We continue to push new initiatives uh, to uh, increase ridership, uh, but it also should be noted that some of the highs that we saw in ridership over the last several years, uh, going back to 2011, uh, you know, really were driven by some of the free ride programs uh, that we saw implemented uh, in the 2008 through 2011 type time frame. Uh, again, those, uh, those gas prices uh, obviously benefit us on an expense side, but also uh, create some additional competition for us on the ridership and revenue side as well. Uh, turning to the 2017 operating budget, uh, we see that the forecast is below uh, the budget. Uh, that is uh, due to really kind of several factors. 
uh, you know, the one that we were not able to uh, fully accommodate uh, was the state budget cuts late in the year. Uh, the, the state budget cuts uh, to uh, the sales tax, to the PTF, to the uh, reduced fare reimbursement, uh, you know, really were a hurdle that we were, um, you know, challenged to overcome so late in the game. Uh, this, uh, we were able to overcome some of the hurdles uh, because we saw those coming uh, through with regard to ridership, with regard to uh, lower than expected uh, sales tax and PTF receipts. Uh, but again, that final kicker with uh, regard to the state's budget cuts um, really left us in a position uh, with little flexibility due to the timing of the announcement as well as uh, the timing of implementation of anything that uh, you know could have corrected uh, that trajectory. So with regard to that, uh, we're proposing implementing uh, the previously approved but not yet implemented uh, line of credit program uh, that was previously authorized for $40 million. Uh, we would propose setting it up for $25 million and drawing down, as expected right now, uh, $17.5 million to help close uh, that final portion of the gap. Uh, again, we were really able to implement quite a bit of additional expense cuts and revenue enhancements throughout the year, uh, but we still have that small uh, tail that we would need to draw down under the line of credit program, uh, and then we would look to repay that as quickly as possible. On the next page, um, we outline the uh, the budget uh, versus the forecast, and again, uh, you see you know significant positive variance there on most of our expense lines. Uh, again, showing that we were able to cut. Um, throughout the year to accommodate the, the pressures that we saw from, um, you know, from our fare box revenues as well as our public funding revenues. On the next page is a brief overview of CTA highlights throughout the years. Uh, for 2017, we implemented new Southside uh, bus and rail improvements. Uh, we opened up some new stations at Washington Wabash as well as the Red Line at Wilson. And like I said, we've also been able to uh, further enhance our revenues from uh, from advertising and concessions. The 2018 capital budget proposal, uh, as Dorval highlighted, is a $2.7 billion program. Uh, this, again, has a, a myriad of funding sources, including federal uh, funds and local funds. But again, no state capital bill has left us a big hole uh, to fill. Uh, that being said, we have been very proactive in, in uh, being able to receive transit TIF revenues, uh, that we'll be able to leverage uh, for additional capital projects, as well as the newly implemented uh, ground transportation tax uh, on ride hailing uh, fees. The next page again just out outlines the diverse source of those revenues, um, you know, from the various funding sources. On the following page uh, is an outline of the uses, again, uh, a myriad of uses across the spectrum. Uh, both for, um, you know, rail lines and the bus system. And then uh, finally here we have uh, an outline of the new ride hailing fee and the uh, proposed projects that would be associated with it. Again, the uh, $16 million that we anticipate uh, receiving from the city in the form of the ride hailing fee uh, will be leveraged uh, to allow us to, uh, to fund those projects as outlined uh, we have two primary buckets of projects that we'll be funding in the form of fast tracks, which is essentially uh, ensuring that commuters' uh, commute time is sped up. And then uh, safe and secure is, again, ensuring a more safe and comfortable uh, riding environment for our customers. The, the next uh, couple of pages just outline some of the, uh, the various projects that we've been undertaking, the 95th Street project as well as just general rehabilitation of the system uh, in, the, in the stations, uh, rolling stock improvements both on bus and rail, the Your New Blue program uh, that's enhancing the, uh, the northwest corridor of the blue line, and then the red uh, purple modernization uh, phase one project that again the transit TIF uh, will help fund. Uh, the Red Line Extension is another important project for us as we look to expand the footprint of the CTA. And then the ICE-funded projects 
uh, we have outlined here, we receive a little over $6 million a year in ICE funding. Uh, we would propose uh, that the rail and bus uh, service improvements uh, that we utilized funds for last year, uh, we would continue to do so. And again, this is for, uh, you know, south side improvements to the system, both on bus and rail. Uh, and then additional uh, funding for safety and security uh, in the form of $2.5 million uh, that will provide additional security and canine units throughout the, uh, uh, the blue and the red lines. Uh, in the appendix, there's just some, uh, you know, additional information with regard to comparison of our fares and, uh, you know, fare increase uh, as compared to other goods. Uh, and again, you know, we've, uh, uh, we've sharpened our pencil, wanted to make sure that we continue to cut expenses, grow other revenues. Uh, and again, that's allowed us to forego a fare increase for, for a number of years. Uh, but again, you know, at this point, um, we are proposing that fare increase of a quarter on the base fare. Thank you uh, for that presentation. If you could do the same that we asked Metro and kind of give us an overview of how your public hearings went, what kind of comments you received uh, from the public so we have that on record. Well, I think um, we still have yet to have our public hearing. Um, uh, one of the challenges that we faced with our budget process this year was it, there were external things that were occurring that were going to stiffly impact the budget, such as the ride hailing fee uh, that the city council just passed um, last week. Um, and that delayed our normal process for pursuing a budget. Uh, we do have a public hearing scheduled uh, for December. Um, uh, we have, um, since we released our budget last week, we have um, uh, reached out and, and provided information to elected officials, both at the state and local level. Um, uh, we continue to provide the normal outreach we would for any budget process. Um, but in terms of feedback and comments, um, uh, at this point in time, we don't have any, any significant feedback because the process just began. Thank you. Uh, the other thing, I guess just a comment, you certainly have brought some innovative ways of bringing new money to the system. Um, the hailing of a ride fee of $16 million, uh, that would go toward capital. I think that's fantastic. I mean, that's an innovative way of doing it. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the using of TIF districts, I mean, we've seen that now for a couple of years, and I think that's another great example of, of really thinking outside of the box and doing something other than cutting fares or, or whatever to balance, to get the revenue you need or to cut uh, services. So I think you've done a, a great job in putting it together. You had a, a very difficult budget this year to uh, <laughs> to try to achieve uh, a balanced budget. And uh, we certainly look forward to uh, having some discussion today from the board, any questions that uh, members might have. So any questions or comments? Yes, uh, Director Lewis. Um, Bill Lewis, <laughs> the same questions that I asked uh, before. Um, the first being uh, looking at alternative sources for funding transit from your point of view, what would you share? I know you've talked about alternative revenue sources, but alternative sources for funding transit, any thoughts that you might have and you might share um, relative to that issue? Yeah, I, 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 I listened to the response that Metro gave to you that, and I, I don't disagree with any of their, <laughs> any of their answers. I think um, uh, there are opportunities, there continue to be opportunities in the transit benefit arena. Um, I agree with, with uh, Chairman Dillard that, um, in my opinion, that's some low-hanging fruit that we can become much more aggressive at. I think there are opportunities for us to develop more stronger partnerships, particularly with major corporations, uh, and offering up unique programs that can benefit their employees and better integrate their options for transportation um, uh, solutions that include CTA and Metra. Uh, and pace as well. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we have working in our favor is that we have the Ventra app, um, which already integrates from a technological standpoint all three of our our services. And I think that there is potential to integrate into that app other transportation options. We are currently addressing Divi bike share as as part of that process. I think there are opportunities to talk to the ride hailing companies about ways that they can integrate into that process. Um, uh, the one thing that's become, I think, very apparent to me as I, as I look at what's going on in the transit industry in general uh, is that our customers like choices. They like having options between how they get from point A to point B. The other thing that I know is that CTA, along with Metro and Pace, 
can only serve that need to some to us to a certain degree. Uh, I am never going to be able to pick you up at your house and deliver you to the front door of your job as mm -hmm. part of any CTA service. Um, but I can probably get you downtown faster than just about any other option that you can take, particularly on rail. Um, uh, and so I think it's important that we're educating and we're communicating to our customer base in ways that allows them to make smart decisions about their transportation options and, and to continue to, to improve and provide a level of quality of service that will entice and encourage customers to use us. Um, so I think there are revenue potentials that can come out of just that discussion alone. I also think there are opportunities that we have in terms of, of advertising, um, concession space. One of the benefits of all the station rehabs and the other work that we're doing is that it also allows us to take another look at what we charge for rent to concessionaires who use that space. When you look at Wilson Station, um, for example, that, that, that is going to be a tremendous opportunity for us uh, in terms of concession space. Uh, it is a beautiful station. It is, it is, you know, dramatically improved over what was there before. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the capital investments are so important, not just because they allow me to reduce my maintenance costs, my operating costs. It also allows me to generate more revenue um, because I can sell <laughs> space at a much higher level if that space is new, modern, has all the appropriate conveniences, uh, and drives ridership increases than I can if it's old and dilapidated and, you know, it's not appealing to people who want to use it. So, um, you know, they, they all kind of feed off of each other in a positive way, and I think they all can provide opportunities for generating revenue. Um, value capture and transfer and development, of course, is another area, and I think the city has been pretty aggressive in supporting those types of opportunities, and I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with the city in terms of identifying more ways in which we can, you know, uh, pursue policies and take advantage of the asset that transit provides that actually drives economic development in the city. Uh, if you look at what's going on with the Amazon proposal right now, um, one of Amazon's big criteria for why they wanted to decide where they're going to place a headquarters was access to transit. We are in a position with this city to have a level of transit services that very few cities in the country can match. LA, Seattle, they're spending billions and billions of dollars right now to build systems that look like what we've got. And so we need to make sure, one, that we're maintaining what we've got, that we continue to improve the services that we have, and we continue to market those services in a way that entices customers and the business community to support what's necessary for transit. And that's, I think, all of those are ways in which we can address that concern. Well, thank you. I, I, I agree. Um, uh, and the second question was on uh, our strategic plan last year. We talked a lot about DBEs and participation in the business that we uh, let. I would in be interested in um, your view on uh, how you participated in that arena in this past year or in the upcoming budget. Yes, we, we, we continue to aggressively pursue opportunities for DBE as part of our program. Um, uh, we also have, over the past year, we've implemented a small business uh, um, uh, initiative that basically uh, put set-asides uh, for small businesses and DBEs that can, that can compete for projects on their own. Um, we have um, um, uh, been aggressive in adding additional language into our contracts that require our contractors, as part of the evaluation process, to present to us their DBE outreach plans. Um, and we also basically hold them in, in the contracts themselves to be committed to engaging that DBE outreach process as part of the contract going forward. Uh, we've been much more visible in our expectations about uh, uh, DBE participation on major capital projects. Um, one of the challenges, of course, that we face is that as we have less capital money, I have less opportunities to basically promote DBE um, contracting as part of our overall program. But uh, where we do have capital money, we continue to aggressively establish goals and to pursue DBE uh, compliance. And in fact, uh, on many of our projects, the contractors are exceeding the DBE goals that we've established for them. So I think it's a very positive story and one that we're going to continue to pursue next year. Other questions or comments? Yes, Director Hobson. Uh, yeah, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, what is your reduced fare strategy? We've heard uh, metro strategy, and what is the CTA's approach to the reduced fares? Um, in, in terms of? Well, the state not funding them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, it costs CTA $100 million a year. That's a lot of money. Fare. It's a lot of money. 
And I believe, you know, very strongly that it's an unfunded mandate, uh, that the state should be subsidizing to the full amount. Um, we obviously, you know, budget for about $28 million in, in, in funding from the state. Um, historically, the state has not even met that obligation, so that continues to be a drag on our overall budget. Um, uh, we have proposed um, uh, a number of legislative fixes that can, that can address the reduced, uh, the free ride challenge um, in terms of, of how it's implemented, who it applies to, and, and, and you know, the, the, the hours that it needs to operate within our system. Uh, none of that has really gotten any traction, but I think that um, our biggest, our biggest you know, reality of dealing with the free ride program is to strictly enforce it. Um, and we are very aggressive in making sure that people who are using the free ride program are eligible um, and that people who are not eligible are not using it or they're not giving them to people who are not eligible and stuff like that. We are very aggressive in RTA knows this because we call them constantly about it, um, uh, of you know, identifying abusers of our system who have free ride passes and making clear that those are not people who are welcome on our system in the future. Um, but as a practical matter, there's, there's not a lot I can do to control it. Um, uh, I can manage it and I can continue to try to pursue policies that will either fund it or better regulate it. And I think that's quite honestly the best strategy that I have uh, for dealing with it right now. So uh, CTA's approach at this point in time is to bite the bullet and, and swallow the cost. Yeah, we, I mean, it's a statutory mandate. I don't have any choice. It, 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 the cost is what it is. I think the, the places where I can impact it on the margins is, like I said, making sure that, it's being, that the, the requirements are being strictly enforced, that we uh, are catching abusers of the system, and we're, we're basically aggressively addressing those as we go forward. And, thank you. And my uh, second question is uh, about the fare increase. Uh, I know that that was a very difficult decision. Um, does it make sense, or what's your strategy going forward, to perhaps have smaller, more frequent price increases, say, indexed to the, the CPI, uh, that maybe makes it more palatable uh, going forward? Well, I, I, my, my, basic, my basic philosophy with regards to fare increases is that they should always be the option of last resort. Um, you know, our customers... Um, face a lot of challenges in terms of their, their cost. Uh, and we, as public agencies, have to show that we're first good stewards of public funds before I can ask my customers for additional money. Um, uh, I think that, that over the past nine years, we've been able to, to do that. And I think, and I'm hopeful, that, that the reaction to the public to this 25 cents fare increase takes in, into account the fact that we have been good public stewards and that the savings that I've been able to generate and the additional revenue I've been able to create has allowed me to pour that money back into additional services uh, for our customers at CTA. Um, I think if, if I can make that kind of a case, I can do a couple of things. One, I can extend the amount of time that I need to do fare increases, and I can better defend a fare increase when I have to do it. Um, do, I know, do I know if I can go another nine years without doing a fare increase? I, I really don't know that. Um, but I, I do know that before I ask our customers to, to incur a fare increase, I want to be able to prove to them that we've done everything we can internally to address the cost that we face um, on an ongoing basis. No, no, you've obviously done a, a, f a fantastic job, and certainly all of us in this room uh, recognize what you've done and been able to accomplish, and that's certainly uh, laudable. But I'm thinking in terms of um, palatability, uh, certainly a nickel fare increase every couple of years may be more palatable to the customers than a quarter increase at one yeah. point in time. Has, has that discussion been, been held at the CTA? Um, I, I can tell you that my board has some very strong opinions about that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, I, in all seriousness, I, I, I've, I've heard the debate on both sides of that conversation. Um, uh, Metro, of course, is, a, is, I think, a terrific example of, of, of an agency that has basically made the commitment to do regular fare increases over time uh, and, and, and um, uh, have implemented on that. Um, I think that both sides of that argument have merit. Um, I think given, given, given the history of CTA and given the, the challenges that we have faced in terms of fare increases and service cuts and other things, 
Um, I believe that, that the philosophy that we're following right now is probably the best philosophy, which is to you know, establish fair increases when you think you absolutely need them, uh, but to continue to make the case. And, and you know, some of this is you don't wait to a fair increase to make that case. It's sort of like the savings that we're generating, the revenues that we're generating, constantly promoting that and getting that message out there so that people can appreciate the fact that you're doing all the things you can do so when you start that fair increase conversation, it's not as, as toxic as it can be uh, in a, under other circumstances. Thank you so much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Other questions or comments? Questions. Yes, uh, Director Higgins. Um, I'm looking at um, the categories of expenses. Your largest expense is labor. 2017 estimate as compared to 2018 budget goes up only 0.7%, which is commendable. Um, the second largest category of expenses is a, a catch-all. It's other expenses and that goes up by 9%. Could you help me understand what resides within that category of other expenses and what's driving that 9% increase? Sure. So the, uh, so the, uh, the other expense line has a number of different uh, components to it. Uh, you know, debt service in particular is, uh, and again, let me take, take one step back. Just as uh, Metro had indicated, uh, the way that we budget is looking at 2017 budget versus 2018 budget. Uh, so, you know, when you look at it in that regard, uh, the total expense line actually drops uh, from 2017 levels. Uh, we were able to, you know, attain some savings uh, in the forecast. Uh, we'll continue to strive to attain savings, uh, you know, in the, um, in the 2018 updates as well. Uh, and as I said, we've done so over the last several years to the tune of about $300 million. Uh, but you know, again, if you look at it in a budget-to-budget -budget perspective, uh, it actually drops uh, about $4 million uh, from, um, from 292 to 288. Uh, but what you see there is with regard to the uh, forecast, uh, the primary driver is with regard to uh, pension obligation bonds, and, and it has to work with uh, the way that we get credit um, and it's a very complicated process, but uh, the way that those credits are attributed to the pension obligation bonds uh, helps drive down that, that line item in particular. Um, in it. Is, is that what you were referring to for, as debt service? or is there, is there Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay, other questions? Just I had a comment on the uh, reserve policy that, as you know, that we always had the 5% and now you're standing on your own. and. Uh, obviously doing a good job because you came through some tough times um, and and were able to pay your bills and so forth. Uh, looking at 2018, as I said to Metro, uh, there's some uncertainty certainly in the budget. Uh, roughly 21.7 <coughs> million uh, hopefully will be there from the state, but you never know. Um, so you've got 21 there. You got 16 million in, in the new uh, rail uh, ride uh, hailing fee. Uh, how, how solid is that $16 million? Do you feel comfortable with that, obviously, that you've included it? Yeah, we, well, we've had a lot of conversation with the city about that number, um, uh, and, and, and I believe it's a conservative number. Um, uh, ride hailing, as all of us know, has been growing almost exponentially in the city uh, over the last several years, and there's no reason to believe that that growth is going to get stunted <coughs> in any way. Uh, we still don't know even how the ride hailing companies plan to deal with this fee, whether they're going to pass it on to their customers, whether they're going to absorb <coughs> it. Uh, but uh, I think that, that you know, Jeremy and, and his team have been working with, with Carol Brown and the financial team over at the city to really come, come together on what that number should look like. Uh, and I'm, I'm confident that, that the $16 million isn't an overinflated number uh, for what we should reasonably expect to come out of that fee. Good. And then the... Uh, Reduce fair reimbursement from the state. I mean, that's about a, almost a $14 million uh, issue with you guys. How, how are you going to deal with that during 18 if, if we have, if, if we're unsuccessful in getting that reinstated by the state? Yeah, I, mean, I think it, that has been a challenge that we have faced every year. <laughs> um, uh, and and um, uh, clearly, if, if that money does not come through, then, then we're going to have to identify additional efficiencies uh, and cost savings to cover <coughs> for that. Um, I think that, that over the past several years, we've done a very good job of doing that. 
Um, you know, the, the, the state historically, you know, every year is a question about whether we're going to get any money at all or if even we're going to get the $14 million. Uh, and then even if it gets we get it, the question of when we're going to see it is always, you know, quite a, somewhat in doubt. So um, we're going to, you know, the, the, the process of managing our resources, controlling costs, um, finding efficiencies, identifying new revenues continues. And, um, you know, this, in this year's budget, we actually exceeded our expectations with regards to both of those issues. Um, I've certainly tasked my staff to exceed my expectations again for next year. Uh, and we'll continue to, to, to engage in that process <clears throat> until uh, we reach a point where the state actually starts to recognize, uh, as I think all of us in this room do, the importance of adequately funding transit at a level that allows us uh, to sustain the systems the way we expect them to be uh, sustained. I, I think we definitely need the, the assistance of uh, the city and going to make sure that we can get that fair reimbursement back. I mean, that's a, that's a big dollar amount and making sure that the PTF funding the way we think it's going to be funded <laughs> is still on the table. Well, I will, uh, I will say this. The, the mayor, you know, I, I've, I've worked for a number of mayors during my career, and, and this particular mayor has put more political capital into supporting transit than just about any mayor I've ever worked for. And he certainly understands and appreciates the financial challenges that have been occurring uh, at CTA as well as at Metro and Pace. Uh, because of the state financial situation, and, and, and he will be, I think, will continue to be an advocate for both getting additional state funding for us, uh, as well as being innovative <coughs> and finding ways in which the city can support uh, transit uh, uh, as we continue to try to find ways to improve our service. That's great. My last question deals with something that Jeremy was talking about. It was the $17.5 million uh, short-term borrowing. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Because I don't know I've ever had a budget that had that in it. Sure, yes, this is a new initiative. Uh, it was uh, previously authorized, uh, you know, years back under the MTA Act. Uh, the $40 million that was previously authorized is, uh, like I said, never been implemented. Uh, what we would do here is we would uh, implement a portion of that uh, to the tune of $25 million for authorization. Uh, and then, you know, we would take that to our board uh, in December, uh, and then we would draw down uh, and based on our current forecast, we would draw down about $17.5 million off of that line. Uh, that, again, is, a, is anticipated to be a short-term borrowing, uh, and we would pay that back uh, in very rapid succession. Uh, so, again, this is just a short-term bridge. Uh, because of the fact that 2017, the, the announcement from the state came so late in the year, uh, it really kind of tied our hands with regard to other options. Let me... Let me amplify what, what Jeremy just said a little bit more in terms of sort of what the CTA's philosophy is around this. Um, while I recognize that we had a tool that was available to us, this is not a tool that I want to use. Um, it is not a tool that I intend to use going forward. Uh, it is a tool that I think served a unique purpose because of the unique timing of the situation with the state and the, and the timing of what our budget, um, uh, you know, how far we were in our budget year. Um, there were very few options that we had available to us to really close that gap with, with the, you know, the, the few months that we had left. My board and my chairman have made it very clear um, to me and to, to Jeremy that they do not want us basically <coughs> using the credit card, uh, to, to, to put it mildly. And so the expectation is that while we've approved it for this, this one-time use for this one-time purpose, uh, it is not something that we intend to regularly go to. Um, uh, as any sort of uh, financial crutch to support CTA. Um, uh, we're using it for this one purpose, for this one sole reason. Um, we're going to pay this debt off as quickly <coughs> as possible, uh, and then we're going to put the tool back in the back pocket and leave it there. Where, where's the expense show up for paying that debt back, or how, how are you paying it back? Uh, the expense uh, is included in the 28, the interest expense is included in the 2018 budget uh, under the, under the uh, debt service line in other expenses, uh, but again, as uh, Dorvalin indicated, the principal will be paid down as quickly as possible, but the <coughs> principal uh, is not outlined uh, in the budget, it's just the interest component right now. The expectation is that we would find, you know, either through additional savings or additional budget revenue enhancements, ways to pay that off. It'll, it'll be, it will be the top priority of our, of our budget activity over the course of 2018. 
in 2017, we achieved $57 million of, uh, of savings as compared to where the budget uh, marks were at, this, at implementation. I just think the, the, the difficult time you've gone through, though, you've had to really tighten things down. And mm -hmm. so the next 17, find an, another 17 million just gets tougher and tougher. So I, I understand that's going to be a challenge. It is tough, but but like I said, I think I think it's it's safe to say that that uh, Chairman Peterson and the rest of my board have made it clear that it's a priority. Um, it is never a good thing to basically be living off of a credit card, um, uh, and it's something that we basically you know philosophically believe needs to be addressed as quickly as possible. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Colson. Sure. Well, I think the CTA does a remarkable job moving the volume of ridership that you do. Um, on an infrastructure, some of which was built during William McKinley's administration. Uh, so I think uh, the public needs to re be reminded that even after this fare increase, your average fare is $1.26, I think. So you, are, you remain one of the world's great bargains. Um, the other question, the elephant in the room for most public agencies these days is uh, debt. And I notice in your capital budget, um, the, the debt service next year will take up up to 35 percent of the whole capital budget. And I know there's been no state capital program in many years. I know a lot of it is pension debt. But is there a master plan to get out from under that kind of a burden, I mean, maybe 10, 15 years from now at least? Or That's a lot of debt, it seems to me, 35 percent of your capital budget. So it's important to note that the additional debt that we're laying on, a, lar a large portion of it, uh, is, is backed by new revenues. Uh, so we hear you loud and clear, we don't like to take on debt either. but uh, the debt associated with the RPM project, uh, that essentially is coming from the transit TIF. Uh, the debt that we're talking about with regard to the new, uh, the funding for, uh, you know, increasing the speeds of the trains and safety and security is coming from the new ground transportation tax. Uh, so again, we, uh, we agree. Uh, we're not looking to uh, further leverage uh, the revenues that we have. Uh, but, you know, these new additional revenues uh, do present us a new opportunity uh, to get the funding in place. And again, if the state funding uh, comes into play, you know, obviously that helps alleviate some of, uh, some of the need as well. I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's safe to say that I think CTA has been extremely innovative in ways to find money for our capital program. Uh, I wish I didn't have to be that innovative. I would very much prefer to be in a normal state of, you know, receiving state funding from a capital program that I would leverage to to um, pursue pursue um, my unmet capital need. Um, but I think in, in the environment that we're operating in, we have had to take on more debt than than I think any of us would have liked to. Um, we're obviously going to manage that debt going forward. Um, the new debt that we're adding, we're adding, I think, in a very smart, strategic way because we're identifying the direct revenue source to support it. Uh, so we're not going to basically find ourselves in a fiscal challenge uh, surrounding that. The the um, um, reality is, is that the, the the revenue streams that we've talked about, both the TIF and the and the ride hailing fee, are more than capable of covering the debt that we're going to issue for for the projects that we're talking about. And so, um, I think that we're being smart right now in terms of how we deal with our debt uh, in the absence of a state capital program. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. President, um, free and reduced rides, do you have a proposal for substantive changes you want the legislature to make in any of those programs that we can take the initiative at the RTA on to, to get rid of some of those? I, you know, I, I would I would love to sit down with with you, Mr. Chairman, and 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 with Leanne, and talk about how we can jointly sort of pursue a strategy around this. I think that, um, uh, you know, I, from a public policy standpoint, I certainly understand the concept of free rides. Uh, I particularly understand the 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 um, uh, groups that 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 have been targeted to receive that benefit. Um, you know, I think we all would love to be in a position where transit could operate for free and everybody <laughs> could, could do that. But uh, I think that there, there needs to be a recognition that if you're going to do it, you need to find a way to pay for it. Um, and we need to find a strategy that's going to create a revenue stream to support it, uh, as opposed to hoping every year that the state legislature passes some money to give us 
to cover some portion of these costs. Um, either that or give us the authority to basically control and regulate it um, so that we can make good decisions and sound decisions given our overall fiscal realities of what we can do and what we can't do. Um, I think either of those approaches would, would be better than the situation we have right now. Um, you know, as a former member of uh, that group that thrust these unfunded mandates uh, on, on people, <laughs> Um, I may be, I, I'm in a position, I'm a, I'm a big boy, I will, will, will help and maybe I'm the right person to sort of go to my former colleagues and say, look, we got a real problem here if you're not going to fund these and um, I'm willing to step up and, and, and sort of be the front person if you need me to do that. So we, we should definitely talk. Well, you know, you, you, you made the point earlier about the gas tax and, and sort of where Illinois stands with regards to any other, you know, you know, state in, in the country. There's going to have to be a conversation about, at some point in time, about, you know, revenue for transportation. I think the key in that discussion is making sure that things like this don't get lost in it because it's very easy to have that conversation in a purely capital sense, but it's also an opportunity to address some operating issues as part of that. And I think, you know, if, if, if and when those kind of discussions take place, I think that there are opportunities there where we can possibly find a way to deal with this issue, in, at least in terms of providing some sort of, of revenue source that takes the burden off of, of the transit system for, for providing these types of rides. No, ab absolutely. Just a couple of comments. Um, the um, Chicago Magazine did a demographic study recently, which I think is to me was, was telling, um, including the largest chunk of the loss of population in the state of Illinois coming from the south side of Chicago and the south suburbs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that, but um, I'd take a look at it. It's clearly, when I, when I overlay it, clearly it shows some of the reasons that buses down were doing better than other, our, our peers. Um, but when you lose a gigantic portion, many of whom are African Americans uh, that used to live on the south side, used to live in the south suburbs, and they're moving to Indiana and other places, um, that's going to impact bus traffic. I mean, we have fewer people in the state of Illinois, uh, and um, that's one that's, that's sort of worth, uh, worth, worth looking at. Um, on the lower gas prices, um, one of the things that I always tell folks is, look, um, in fact, the average price of gas today, I know, is $2.55 because I heard it on the radio this morning. That's the average price for gas in Illinois. It's $2.55. Um, but only about a quarter of the cost of operating an automobile is the gas price. Three quarters of the other cost of the car is insurance, it's maintenance, it's the actual purchase of the car. Uh, and I think people are, are surprised that, yeah, gas prices may be you know, down a little bit, but it's only, a, you know, it's only a little bit of the cost of the operation of that car. And I think we as a transit system um, need, to, uh, need to make that case. Um, I, uh, uh, I looked at a Scott Santis cartoon, uh, <laughs> which I thought was, was very good. It's nice to get some, you know, some, some real pat on the back every now and then from the, uh, from the Chicago Tribune. And the Santis cartoon, um, showed everything else over the last eight or nine years going up in price, um, you know, iPhone, Blackhawk tickets, Cubs tickets. You had a little graphic like that. Um, but at the end, it said CTA fares $2.25, CTA fares $2.25, and it said, um, and you call, you know, uh, uh, you know, a quarter increase after nine years, outrageous question mark. And then he wrote a little column if you go online. But mm -hmm. I thought uh, it was nice to get the pat on the back um, when they compare them, you know, just the cost of living over that, that, that time period. Um, the other point of that cartoon, I think, is, yeah, the Blackhawks are better, the Cubs are better, um, but the service on the CTA is much better today uh, than it has been. And I've taken the CTA for 50 years, uh, and your service is improved. Uh, and uh, just like the Cubs and the Blackhawks are better than they were uh, over the last nine years, so are you guys. Uh, and I think 
as a rider of transit, whether it's Don Orsino's Metro system, I was on your system probably five or six times, Dorval, last week. Um, it's much better today than it's been in, in years, and it's going to continue through your vision, the vision of the mayor, um, as well as the city council. And I thank the mayor and the city council. Um, I always tell people, you can say whatever you want about Mayor Emanuel, but you've never, I've never seen a better mayor with respect to understanding and advocacy for mass transit than Rahm Emanuel. And I really give him credit for understanding it. And he understands how you impact economic development yeah. and why Chicago's led the nation in the last five or six years in corporate relocation. The CTA is a major, major reason along with Metra uh, and to some extent pace as to why we have the, those statistics. Um, but that Scott Santos cartoon also should have said, hey, and there's improved service, uh, like improved improvement at Wrigley Field and, you know, at the United Center um, as well. Um, so, you know, thank you. Your innovation, uh, whether it's the TIF or ride hailing, um, never ceases to amaze me. Uh, you're going to have to continue to dip into your innovation basket, um, <laughs> but we're we're here to help, including um, stepping up on free and reduced rides or anything else you, you need us to do. So thank you, and, and I know our staff greatly appreciates the, the cooperation, Jeremy and Dorval, of, of all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. I, I um, you know, I, I want to echo something that that Don mentioned uh, during during uh, Metro's presentation, which is, I, I've I've been around uh, CTA a long time. I've been around RTA a long time, and um, the relationship that that CTA along with Metro and Pace have with RTA has been better than I've ever known it in my entire career. And a lot of that has to do with the leadership that's exhibited by both yourself and Leanne and and. Um, I certainly appreciate it. It makes my job a lot easier when we're all working together uh, to improve the transit in this region. And um, uh, you've been terrific partners uh, and advocates uh, for CTA, and, and uh, I've appreciated um, your, your support. Thank you. Can I make one last point? Um, my wife and I went, and uh, when I first met my wife, she rode out of the Wilson station every day. She was an <laughs> urban pioneer living uh, in Uptown. So I'm proud of my wife that she lived in Uptown, you know, a real, a real existence. The improvement of that Wilson station to, you know, when I used to ride it, um, I wasn't actually afraid of the clientele that might have been around that station. I was afraid of falling through the floor on that old station. Um, but that improvement is amazing. And talking to the alderman up there, um, you know, the vision that you can have for uh, that area, um, you know, really gentrified around that Wilson Avenue station uh, is amazing. And I know the residents of Uptown are so excited, and, and that change is, is mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. That and the 95th Street station, I mean, I always, and I, I saw Speaker Madigan yesterday, and um, I always remind the speaker that not everything we do is geared around the central business district of Chicago. It really impacts regular neighborhoods, whether it's Uptown, 95th Street, which is a workhorse center, um, or in the speaker's case, the Orange Line. Uh, you know, and, and the number nine, you've sensitized me to the number nine bus, which is <laughs> our busiest bus. You know, those folks are not coming when they're riding up and down north and south. Um, they're not coming downtown, but most of those people don't own an automobile within a half a mile or a mile of, of that route. Um, but what we do impacts neighborhoods. It's just not all about the downtown business district, and I've never forgotten it. But that Wilson Avenue station, when I was on it with my wife going, now this is just incredible compared thank to you. the old one. Uh, and what it means to that neighborhood is phenomenal. So thanks. I just wanted to Thank you. We're, we're, we're very proud of it, and, and we'll be opening up the Gerber building, which is the historic building across the street from it, um, uh, early next year. So it, it's going to be a completion of a major renovation for that community. And it, you know, I always make the point that transit is more than just moving people from point A to point B. It's about connecting communities and connecting with communities. And I think the the example you gave at Wilson Station is, a, is certainly a, a, a prime indicator of exactly what I talk about when I make that point. Great. Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, we certainly appreciate your appearance and thanks for doing a great job. Thank you.
Our next budget is PACE. Uh, we'll be bringing up uh, Director uh, Ross, uh, Rocky Donahue, and Reynaldo Dixon. Okay. Once again, uh, good morning. My name is T.J. Ross. I'm the executive director at PACE, and we're going to present our 2018 budget to you this morning. There's a different face doing that, but a familiar one. And uh, Rocky, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, T.J. Um, <laughs> okay. As a way to introduce myself, I'm Rocky Donahue. I'm the deputy executive director of external relations, and I am currently acting as the uh, deputy executive director of internal services. I'm in this interim role. While I'm new to this role, I've been with PACE. I'm in my 35th year. I started in 1983 with the RTA as a financial analyst, so I have a little bit of a finance background, but I've spent the majority of my career um, in external relations. To start with, I, I really want to thank the RTA staff, in particular Leanne, um, Dee, and, and Jeremy LaMarche. The, the three of them have, have gone more than out of their way to to make me feel comfortable in this new role and, and assist in any way possible and that's been I've been very grateful for that i'd also like to thank tom farmer and and jeremy fine of of metro and, and cta who have who have also kind of uh helped the new kid on the block a little bit i'd be remiss if i didn't thank the, the pace staff ronaldo dixon who is our department manager of budget janet coon who oversees our capital budget if, if, you, if you like what you hear today, and if you thought the PACE budget was a good budget, it's absolutely a result of these individuals sitting next to me. If, if you don't like what you hear, it's, I've just done a bad job uh, <laughs> delivering the message. So, so I, I, I get that, and, and, and if need be, I'll, I'll do better next time. So to start, we'd like to recap 2017. So you heard from our, our, our sister agencies, we, we faced the same problem. 2017 was the perfect storm. Uh, on the revenue side, all, all three big areas of our revenue were down. Fairbox revenue was down, declining sales tax, and uh, state funding. Um, good news, we believe we're going to end 2017 on the suburban service side with a $4 million uh, positive budget variance. The other thing I'd like to point out is we also built into our 2017, we talked a lot about not having a capital bill. We, we, our 2017 build budget was built with $7 million of operating money being transferred into the capital budget. We call it a transfer capital, and we assume the $4 million positive budget variance will also go to capital. So we'll be, we'll be moving $11 million in 2017 over to our capital budget. Um, just to highlight that, since 2010, the last time the state had a capital budget, we have moved over $100 million of operating money to help support our, our capital budget. And, and that's not unique to PACE. Metro and CTA have, have done a lot more, but, but we've done our fair share as well. Um, let's, let's get to 2018, or we'll go to ridership first, sorry. Our ridership, you, you heard the report earlier on fixed route, it is up 1.2%. We, we had some, the comments is, you know, is this a result of our express bus services? And it absolutely is 100%. Prior to um, bus on shoulders and I-55, we were carrying around 300 people a day in 2011 on, on that route. Today we're carrying 2,300 people a day. Our I-90 service that, that we implemented last year before we, I-90 open, the ridership was about 100 a day. T today it's about almost 700 a day. So we are seeing phenomenal growth on, on those. Um, and we're excited to say in, in 2018, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, we're going to be operating on the shoulder of the Edens. And so we, we, we expect big gains as that in that area too. But 
while those are great things to talk about, they've presented their own challenges, primarily on the capital side, as it relates to equipment and facilities. Um, but our ridership for, for 2018, we project to basically be level, actually down a little less than 1%, and that's due primarily to the proposed fare increase that, that, that we are calling for in our 2018 budget. So we'll, we'll get to the 2018 budget is balanced, and it's balanced. Um, we, we are facing a $12 million hole. You heard from, from our sisters, and, and our hole is the same reason. Uh, declining sales tax, primarily due to the Internet and the slumping Illinois economy, and the cuts that we received from the, the state of Illinois in our budget. Uh, not to not to be a smart aleck, but this isn't rocket science. We 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 have really two tools. We raise revenue, we cut expenses, and and we're doing both. Um, we are proposing a 25 cent fare increase on our cash and, and transit uh, Ventra value. So our 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 Ventra fare will go from a dollar seventy five to two dollars, and our cash fare will go from two dollars to two twenty five. We are proposing a 50 cent fare increase on our premium routes, which are our express routes, plus on shoulder service and service we, we call the popular destinations, Cubs bus, Bears bus. Um, those fares are currently $4, they'll go to $4.50. There is no fare increase on van pool or dollar ride. This fare increase will generate about $2.3 million. There will be no increase to our, our price of our passes. And it is our first fare increase since 2009. Um, so, so what are we doing to lower expenses? The fare increase will get us about 2.3 million of the 12 million. We are instituting a corporate hiring freeze. 35 positions within our corporate office um, are not going to be filled. These are real positions. These are, these are work that, that somebody has to do and who's gonna do it are, are the people that are there. We believe this will save us approximately $3 million. Our, our corporate employees, well, going back to the hiring freeze, it will not impact operations. So we, we will not, um, we will, I mean, continue to hire drivers, maintenance on the vehicles. This is only in the corporate office. Our corporate employees will also be paying more for their health insurance, 6% um, more. I'm using this only as an example. I'm not telling you this is the cost because every plan is different, but if an employee is currently paying $100 a month as their contribution for health insurance, next year they're gonna be paying $106. Um, so besides doing more work by having the freeze, they'll, they'll also be paying a little bit more for their health health care. So we're doing our part in the corporate office. And capital expenses, as I mentioned to you earlier, we transferred $7 million of operating um, to capital in 2017 and, and in the last nine years we've moved over a hundred million dollars of operating money to our capital budget we're not going to be able to do that in 2018 and that is approximately five million dollars that we would have normally been able to take from our operating budget to to help pay for capital we are proposing no service reductions to balance the budget now I want to put a little asterisk behind that Quarterly, we, we evaluate all our routes on, for service performance, fare box recovery ratio, ridership, and, and we are constantly bringing um, service to the pace board that doesn't meet standards. So it's possible we will, we will be having some service reductions, but it won't be a, a budget balancing act. It would be purely because it, it just does not, it's poor performing service, and we do this on a, on a regular basis. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like it's all doom and gloom. We have a lot of great things still going on in 2018. We have enhancements, our I-55 bus on shoulders. It is so popular, as I mentioned, we'll be actually enhancing some service there. In the summer of 2018, we, we, we hopefully will be operating our Pulse Milwaukee line. They are starting to construct those, those um, stations now. We have two new I-90 park and ride stations being built at Barrington and Illinois 25. We have a pedestrian bridge being built at Barrington Road. We are expanding services to UPS, FedEx, Amazon. I know it's a little, little odd that 
Amazon internet sales are, are hurting us, but Amazon has built two big distribution centers, one in Romeoville, one in Joliet, and we have seen ridership uh, just since August at about um, 100 people a day on those services, just taking those employees to, to work at Amazon. Our South Division garage will be fully operational with CNG. We conservatively believe that saves us about a million dollars a year in our fuel costs just because of the per gallon equivalent of CNG is about a dollar less than, than diesel. And as I mentioned earlier, it will be running on the Edens bus on shoulder, um, hopefully in the spring of 2018. Our, our capital budget, or nope, sorry, we're going to paratransit. I'm, I, I don't have this memorized. <laughs> so, ADA paratransit budget 2017, as a result, we're going to end up about a million dollars um, to the negative at the end of the day. And why is that? Primarily because of the state of Illinois. Since 2009, we've received a, a grant from the state for eight and a half million dollars to offset the costs of paratransit. Um, the last two years, we've gotten about $4 million out of the total of $17 million. And we, our 2017 budget was built with the expectation we're going to get that $8.5 million, and I believe our estimates are we'll get about 3.8 of that, 8.5. So that if we if we had received the entire $8.5 million, we'd be looking at a positive budget variance on ADA, I believe, for the third or fourth year in a row. Um, but that that million dollars, we, we have a reserve for ADA, and we've worked with, talked to the RTA staff, and, and if, in fact, we do come under, that will be covered with the reserves we have, we have built up over the last four years on ADA. So for 2018, we are proposing a, a fair increase we go, for, uh, or we're going to ridership. Okay, ridership on ADA has, has gone up slightly for 2017. What's that? Okay, for 2017, we believe ridership will go up about 1.5%. Uh, in 2018, we believe it's going to go up about 1%. A lot of that will, the growth would have been a little bit higher, but we are proposing a fair increase on, on ADA as well. So when we get to the ADA budget, the ADA budget is balanced, but it does ask for a 25 cent fare increase. That'll save us approximately $2.1 million. Um, it's the first fare increase in the suburbs on ADA since 2000, and, I mean in the city since 2009, and the first one in the suburbs since 2005. Our tap fare in the city, which is the taxi access program, that fare will remain at $3. And it assumes, once again, we're going to get the $8.5 million from the state of Illinois. Um, and the, the increase matches our fixed route proposal. So we're, we are, we're, we're treating all of our passengers, we believe, the same, that, that we're all in this together and we're all going to have to share that burden. Um, an enhancement in 2018 is that we will provide uh, free ride vouchers for trips that are more than 80 minutes late. 80 minutes seems like an odd number. That's an hour late because by ADA you have a 20-minute window. So take the 20-minute window to be on time, and then all those trips that are more than an hour late will reimburse. For those of you who are wondering, okay, what's that going to cost the system? Our estimate from if we, if we did this the past three years, was less than $75,000 a year. And what happens, though, is we recoup that money from the carriers as we, we, we implement what we call liquidated damages. So when the carriers are more than an hour late, they don't get reimbursed for the trip, we don't pay for the trip, and we don't make the customer pay for the trip either. Hmm. Um, next, yep, yeah, thanks. So our capital program is roughly $62 million. It's primarily in, in buses and in, in rolling stock and in, in repairing facilities. If we can go to the next slide. This just shows you the $62 million in, in, in a pie chart format, but I really want to focus your attention on that middle pie chart. Um, out of the $62 million, $40 million of it is from the feds. $15 million is our proposed using uh, 
our own bonding to purchase land for a new Northwest garage, a little bit of CMAC money and a little bit of RTA ICE money, and as you've heard from CTA and Metro, nothing from the state of Illinois. And, and that's, that's irresponsible at, at best. And so that's what I have. I'd be happy to address any questions or concern, and I thank you for your, your patience and your time. Rocky, before you get off these charts, on the um, ADA ridership, is it 4,000 riders uh, that you're talking about? No, the estimate is that you, you we need to add, that's millions, so it would be 3.1 million, yeah. so that would be okay. 42,000 riders. Yeah, okay. Right, we, okay. we probably needed, it's no, in okay. triple I, I zeros at the top, yeah, see yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were just commenting yeah. on that. <laughs> Could you also uh, provide us any input that you received from the uh, public, from your public hearings? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We PACE held 13 public hearings, um, four of them in the city of Chicago is related to our ADA service and nine throughout uh, suburban Cook and in the Collar counties. We had uh, 90 people attend those 13 hearings. Out of the 90 people, 40 provided testimony. More than half of the testimony was service related. And by that, bus is late, I need a shelter here. Roughly the half that did comment about the budget was mostly about ADA, and their comments were, were generally 25 cents is going to be hard for our community because we're on a fixed income. And the second issue was if you're expecting us to pay more, we'd like to see the service improve. And what was your response about improving service for them and to, to their overall concerns? Uh, our response at public hearings is we, we, we generally don't respond at the public hearing. We give the opportunity for the, 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 the customers. But, but, but to you, in the sense of improving service, we work really hard um, to improve our ADA service. And when you compare us to our peers, we, we are one of the, the nation's best in the sense of the performance of our service. We've had, in the last four years, two triennial audits by the FTA on our ADA service and we've received perfect scores on, on both of those audits. In fact, the last one last year, the FTA administrator of Region 5 told us that it was the best ADA audit she had seen in her, out of every system she, she had audited. Now, having said that, are we perfect? Of course not. And, and the example I'll use is, is our on-time performance system-wide is about 88%, nearly 90%. We do between 16,000 and 20,000 trips a day. So at a 90% on time performance, that means 1,600 to 2,000 trips every day go awry. And for those individuals when those trips go awry, that's not good because this service is their lifeline. They're dependent on this service. Unlike the CTA or Metro, where the vast majority of their riders are choice riders, they own an automobile, they, they, can, they choose Metro and CTA, they want to pay parking, they want to deal with with congestion, these ADA riders don't have a choice. And if it doesn't work, they don't get to the doctor. They don't get to their jobs. They don't become part of things we take every day for granted. So I assure you the PACE staff takes this very seriously and we work really hard uh, to, to improve it. But I'm not gonna sit here and tell you it's perfect because it's not, we're humans. We make mistakes and there's a lot of things out of our control. When, when, when you drive your car, and traffic's slow, well, it's slow for us. We don't have a fixed guideway. I don't have a dedicated rail line. I'm on the same city streets you're on. When there's a, a parade or Chicago Marathon and streets are closed down, well, that, that screws up the flow of traffic. We get two inches of snow, it, it screws up the flow of traffic. So there's a lot of things I can't control, but the things we can control, we, we work really hard on improving them. And one of the enhancements, we're going to reimburse those trips that are more than... 80 minutes late. I think that's great. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, questions. Uh, Rocky, uh, what are the plans? I didn't see it on the chart, but uh, what is the future or the plans PACE has working with the uh, uh, Elgin O'Hare Expressway when that is completed? So we have a great relationship with, with the tollway. In I-90, um, the tollway invested 
$400 million? $250 million putting in a, a flex lane, it's called, that right now only pace buses are allowed to use, and that's what's generated a lot of the growth of ridership. That I-90 corridor from Elgin to Rosemont, a lot of people don't realize, has as many jobs as in the central business district of the city of Chicago. There's many jobs there. But that partnership with the tollway has allowed transit to, to exist where in that corridor where it hasn't before. We've, we've been part of the, the, the 390 um, to, renovation overhaul with the tollway. We, we, we're, I'm not sure we're going to get a flex lane, but we're, we, we're working with it. We, we're working with if there's ever a western access to O'Hare. So our, our hope is to, to do that. As it relates specifically for 2018, we don't have a service um, implementation plan for 2018, but as that corridor begins to grow and the needs do, we'll, we'll address it. Yes, uh, Director Higgins. Um, I have a, a little confusion about how ridership um, has, uh, to the extent to which ridership has decreased on um, a van pool from 2016 to 2017. I saw one number I thought that said 7%, another that said 9.7. Do you happen to know? Um, I, are you talking about two different pace numbers or you saw an RTA there number? There was an versus RTA number earlier today, I think, that was 9.7. Rocky, Rocky, I'll, I'll assist with right. that. So uh, <laughs> the National Transportation Database is what Jessica reported on, on the quarterly performance reports. It's a different time frame. That information is typically older, just because okay. of the time allotment that the transit agencies have to report that um, statistic. So okay. that's all it is. It's, it's a timing difference. Okay. But PACE provides both pieces of information to the NTD. So it is consistent. It's just Got timing. It. So let, let's then assume that 7% is the more accurate, okay. more recent number. Did I, did I see the projection for 20? 18 is that ridership change for van pool would be zero zero percent how do you go from seven percent decrease to zero what are you what are you doing differently so, or is it circumstances no what what where a lot of our decrease in van pool has been really in two two parts and we we we, we offer primarily two different types of van pools there is a third one but the two really main ones are what we call our our vip program which is a group of individuals say the six of us all work here at RTA, we all live near each other, we all get in a van pool, one drives, picks up the other five, we go to work. That's our traditional program. Another program we call our Advantage program, which is ADA. And, and it's generally done by, in, in the suburban air, it's, it's exclusively right now in the suburbs. Um, and what I'm going to term workshops, and I don't know on, if that's the politically correct term, but, but it's a it's a, a facility that individuals with disabilities will go to and they may work there they may get training there um, Clearbrook uh, what are what are some of the bigger ones little that lambs little lambs farm um, or lambs farm um, we have oh, 70 of them in the area and and they they take the vehicle they pick up those individuals with the disabilities and bring them to the facility in the van the cuts in um, the state of Illinois to human services has decimated a lot of those programs, and we've seen a lot of a lot of loss in our van pool program as a result of those cuts in in from the state of Illinois those human service programs. We we hope we believe now that the state has a budget and maybe there's 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 some sort of leveling off that we are not going to see that. The other the other van pool issue we're having is is the corporate world has changed and our van pool program hasn't unfortunately kept up with it and that's something internally we're working on and what i mean by that is the rules of our van pool program don't don't comply with happens today a lot of people work from home today they'll have maybe one day work from home four days in the office they have different hours employers are a little more flexible and our van pool program is you got to pay for the whole month or we don't have a daily rate we don't have a weekly rate we don't have a so we've we've lost because it it's it hasn't met the needs and as corporations what we're also seeing is a lot of corporations are going 
we've heard Dorval say, from the suburbs into the city, they're attracting, um, the city's attracting a lot of corporations because of the millennials. So those suburban campuses are, are just not, the employers aren't there anymore. Sears, Motorola, and Schaumburg, those which had big Vanpool part of our program, when, when, when they've shuttered, it's, it's hurt us in that regard too. Other questions? Yes, Director Lewis. Oh, thank you. Brian, he says I promised uh, two questions. Um, the first being, uh, uh, and particularly in, some, in light of some of the things you mentioned, um, alternative sources of funding for public transportation, what your thoughts might be, you or TJ, on, on that particular area, because it's going to be very important in our discussions going forward. Okay. I've, I've got a list. And the, the first thing that I have on the list is now that we're paying 2% of the state to collect the sales tax, Let's make sure that they have a method that does collect the sales tax. I'm not convinced they have one. I suspect it's a legacy system that doesn't fit with the uh, modern electronic fee system that we're running now. Uh, also, alternatively, uh, there's a lot of talk about expanding the sales tax base. That's, that's a, certainly a different economy than sales tax was originally. You know all these things. So that's the first one. Uh, now we're paying for it. Okay, do your job. Collect all the sales tax. The uh, second one is, is that uh, as we see in the I-90 corridor, uh, land prices out there have gone from eight, nine, ten dollars a square foot. Uh, we're hearing twenty, twenty-two dollars a square foot. A lot of development uh, happening in the I-90 corridor and in these other corridors where we've made major public investments and uh, public transit impact fees. Uh, go for sewer, water, those kinds of things. Certainly impact fees for public transit uh, makes sense. Uh, you're going to come in and put in uh, 10,000 employees into an area or 500 or 5,000 employees. That has an impact on public transit. We need to look at impact fees. It's a common way municipalities have funded these things. Old, old stuff on revenue. We have a federal, federal rules. We can't provide school service. That was done, I think that was done probably 35 years ago, uh, my memory of that. Uh, it impacted where I was working at the time. It impacted, we can't do school service, so we have to maintain as a public two, uh, two fleets. In some cases, that makes sense. In some cases, that makes no sense. But locally, we ought to be able to make that decision and, uh, and pr use our resources. Uh, we can't do charters. Even if it's a huge charter that no public uh, operator, no no private operator can handle. Uh, we have to go through a real mess. We, uh, charters used to be a significant part of revenue in a public transit system. We can't do that. And that, that's another one. Uh, and then the two age-old ones. Workers' comp costs, help, help. Liability exposure that we have, unlimited liability exposure that we have. Uh, what we see going on in the, uh, in the awards, and you've all seen it, just is scary. It could turn a whole budget upside down, one really bad award. And uh, there seem to be more of them than less of them. So give us some revenue. Let us go into some areas that we haven't gone into before. Uh, maybe in the suburbs uh, we ought to look at the transit system having a little bit more to do with the uh, uh, with the connected transit, is it CNT connected network, the Uber lifts uh, regulation kinds of things because there's so many communities it's very difficult to do for all the individual communities. Maybe transit's the one that should be doing that. Uh, and we can integrate it into our services. There's just, a, I think, a whole wealth of things that we can do that. You, what really would help is a modern traffic signal control system. That would really help because what does that do? That increases our speeds. And the other thing is a kind of a traffic engineer in training. The King's Highways are not the people's stables. Get the cars off the arterial streets. Don't allow them to park there. That is a safety problem. That is a speed problem. That is all kinds of problems. But when you see in the suburbs where, we, where they do not allow cars parked on arterial streets, that's a much safer, faster operating environment, and when you, uh, when, and that needs to happen. Uh, we need to. The streets are for moving vehicles, not for parking. 
and uh, that uh, is kind of my list. And alternative, it's a way of reducing costs, increasing revenues, and then uh, also making sure that we're getting the funding, the funds that we should be getting from the sales tax that exists out there right now. Thank you, TJ. Um, I'm, I'm glad you had a few thoughts on that area. <laughs> My second and final question is uh, on DBE participation and programs that you have uh, success or um, uh, how that's fared so far. Well, uh, we made some changes at, at PACE, and uh, we have some new staff, and, and, uh, and what we've uh, done is uh, we had a goal of 11.4% in 2017, and we're going to come in at about 15.7%. So we think we're making, uh, we're making progress. This is as good as it should be. Of course not. Uh, but uh, we're going to – I know that what they say, everything before the but is, uh, is inconsequential. This has to happen. Uh, the small business part of the law is going to help us a lot. And uh, that's the part that I'm putting pressure on staff internally to activate, to get that that part of it going to do because we can do set asides for small businesses now and that has that I think uh, will bring more of that money back to Illinois where it should be yes director Hobbs uh, yes I have uh, two questions uh, one is uh, regarding the rideshare programs uh, from a strategic point of view is pace looking to leverage ride sharing as opposed to say looking them at, looking at them as competition, but somehow looking to partner with them, either for out in the collars, the last mile, or uh, as a dial ride supplement to reduce your costs. I know in McHenry County, a uh, typical dial ride is costing sixteen, seventeen dollars uh, in terms of pure cost, and you know perhaps there's a way of reducing that cost by leveraging the rideshare services. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Director, and we 100% are looking at how we partner with, with, with them, not run away from them or fight them. The issue, quite honestly, is it relates to, to rideshares right now, and it's not unique to PACE, is, is how does Uber stand in our shoes as it relates to FTA requirements? And, and we cannot just enter into an agreement with them because they don't meet our drug and alcohol standards that we're required to have by the federal government. They don't meet our safety background checks. They're, the, Uber isn't even a transportation company. They're a technology company. And, and, and so that's, that's the challenge we're facing. So what we're looking at is similar to the model we, we have in the city of Chicago with our TAP program. How do we make it a, a, a user subsidy? Instead of partnering with necessarily Uber, we subsidize the user. We subsidize the user's trip. In essence, they can get, I'm making the numbers up, they, they get a $10 Uber ride and they pay the $2 fare that they would pay if Pace, and Pace pays the other $8. That requires the technology, quite honestly, of integrating Ventra into Uber and Lyft. So we definitely, we've met with those rideshare companies numerous times. Um, we've, I don't want to say we're trying to figure out a way to, to skirt federal law because we, 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 we follow all the laws. <laughs> but, but the challenge we're faced is that the, the federal requirements of primarily drug and alcohol and ADA compliant vehicles, if it's an ADA trip, or if it's not even an ADA trip, if it doesn't have, if it's a vehicle shows up and it's a little Toyota Corolla, how does it meet ADA accessibility? And those are, those are laws we have to follow and our carriers, when we hire our carriers, have to follow those laws. So that's, that's the, that in a nutshell is the challenge. Well, we're yeah, certainly they, they couldn't comply with ADA or be there for ADA rides and I would still fall into the purview of PACE, but there are many non-ADA rides that, that right. PACE provides that per perhaps they could supplement. But to kind of summarize your comments, you're actively pursuing some sort of avenue yes. of utilizing or leveraging these rideshare services. Ab absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much for that. A and my second question, uh, I guess, would fall to uh, Chairman Dillard, and that is, and it applies to uh, all the service boards, 
uh, uh, I'll call it the Amazon tax. I mean, Amazon is uh, paying sales tax, or I'm paying sales tax when I purchase from Amazon, but I don't, I, I believe that's only the state sales tax and doesn't include things like the RTA tax that me living in McHenry County would be paying. Is there some effort to force online retailers, and I'm just picking on Amazon because they're the big gorilla, um, is there some effort to force them to collect these supplemental uh, taxes like the RTA tax? We are uh, in ongoing discussions with the Illinois Department of Revenue. Uh, we have a meeting with the director herself. And I like Director Ross's idea if we're going to, you know, have 2% of our RTA sales taxes siphoned off to Springfield, uh, we ought to doggone make sure that they're, they're, they're actually doing the collecting. So, Blake, we're, Director Hobson, we're talking to the Department of Revenue. We're trying to get a handle on this. Um, but, uh, you know, I was on my high horse the last meeting about how outrageous it is uh, that they siphon off 2%. Um, but we ought to make sure, as DJ has said, that they're actually collecting what they're supposed to be collecting if they're going to take nearly, you know, and the number's staggering. Um, over an 18-month period to our systems, that's almost $40 million that they're going to give to the Illinois Department of Revenue. That's just us. That's not even the local mayors or municipalities. Um, so we're talking to them, and we're, we're all over this because we, we clearly have to have a solution. I was very heartened uh, to see the Illinois Municipal League uh, is, you know, and we need to get on their bandwagon, is trying to get that fee reduced to a half a percent. Um, their point was no one ever sh has told us what it's really costing the Illinois Department of Revenue to collect sales taxes and how do you get 2% uh, out of you know thin air uh, for the appropriate fee. So we're all over this, but we are talking to the Department of Revenue and, uh, and, and TJ, I agree with you. If, if we're going to pay something to the state, whether it's a half a percent or 2%, we've got to make sure they're actually doing their job and doing the collecting. Can I just also jump in and just add, I, I think what I'd like to propose to the board too, after those conversations, and the, I mean, Jeremy has had a lot of time talking with Department of Revenue, but then there's going to be some follow-up discussions with the chairman and others um, that we, maybe we put together. We've had some of these conversations in very piecemeal fashion with the board, and I think it might be better for us as, at staff level post those meetings to sort of put together a more holistic summary of all the issues. It's complicated. TJ and I did several rounds on this just earlier this week um, and, and lay it out for the board so there's a better, a sort of a fuller understanding of what is and isn't collected, how it's collected, what we know, what we don't know, what I, Department of Revenue knows and doesn't know, uh, and then a, and actually have not just share with you a memo, but actually maybe do a presentation at the maybe a January board meeting or something like that where we can actually sort of have everybody on a base level playing field of understanding what it is and isn't, and then a game plan going forward. That would be great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I have a, just a quick one, and then I'll turn it over to the chairman. On the uh, Medicaid reimbursement dropping from a million five to 250000 is that a permanent cut, or is that a time of payment, a delayed payment, or what is well, that? Well, that, that, that was um, developed, as you heard uh, both Metro and CTA say in developing their budget, it's, it goes by trends. Um, we're not getting paid by the state of Illinois. And we don't have confidence we're, we're going to get it from the state of Illinois. So to answer you, I would, I would hope it's, it's, it reverses and, and we, we, we get back to one, 1. 1.5 million, but I, I can't have any confidence we're going to. My last comment, I guess, is the 5% um, reserve policy we used to have. You've stepped up to the plate, and, and you're managing your own uh, reserve uh, to handle the problems that, uh, that you're confronted with. And, of course, looking at the 2018 budget, uh, PACE has about a million nine of funding that is questionable at, at, at minimum when you think um, the about 1.3 for the um, – fair reimbursement if that doesn't come through at the full level. Uh, how, what, what provisions have you made uh, 
for being able to deal with that. So we 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 have a rainy day fund, a fund balance, and we t we take that serious. Our fund balance is currently roughly um, eighteen million dollars, which is about ten percent of our of our public funding total of roughly a hundred and seventy million dollars. So if, if that one point nine came into into effect, we would we would use it for that. Um, but like our sister agencies, we're, we're very concerned of the, the, the dark clouds ahead, and, and, and we may also have to make some midterm adjustments because our budget is also built on the state of Illinois um, reversing, if that's the right term, some of, some of the actions that they took with their fiscal 2018 budget. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Um, very quickly. If PACE, where do you stand in terms of, in the United States, um, in terms of bus ridership, if, you know, as a system, are you the fifth or sixth largest system uh, in the country? If you can, I don't know if you want to answer it today, but when I'm out there talking to people, I always try to tell them the size of your system dwarfs what many would think are major cities. The, there's an annual... Uh, report that's put out by uh, one of the transit magazines and it looks at the rubber tired fleets the uh, there's three rubber tired fleets that operate more vehicles and th this includes our van pool vehicles mm -hmm. and those are New York City New Jersey and LA uh, the uh, number of rubber tired vehicles that we have on the road on a regular basis uh, we're fourth in the country ridership of 30 uh, you know in the thir 35 to 40 million uh, is uh, you know, isn't anything close to any of those three agencies, of course. So if I tell people, essentially, you're, you would be in We're the top operating five. the fourth largest rubber tire fleet in the country. And Good. I just want to make sure when I'm out there. Yeah. Um, Chairman, we, we are, from a ridership standpoint, the largest in the nation that does not serve a central business district. There is nobody in the nation that carries more people than us that, that does not serve a central business district. We're also the largest suburban only system in the nation and and we're also the largest bus only bus only transit system in the nation gotcha um on ada and getting our paratransit money back um how are you working with some of these advocacy groups when we go to springfield i mean the more we can partner up with uh with these advocacy groups to tell the story the better I mean, we have a concerted effort with groups. Yes, we, we, we have partnered in the past with numerous groups. Um, we, we work our ADA committees in, 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 in those regards. We, we, we have a call to action, um, email, newsletter, social media. Uh, we try to get them engaged. Uh, the harsh reality of the last two years is social services has just been pounded right. in the state of Illinois that, that, that ADA was one of a hundred issues they were, that, that they were advocating for. But we do try to activate that, that community every chance we can. Yeah. Great. And last but not least on, uh, on Director McGallis's comment, I know the governor is making it major announcement today on Medicaid so you know um, see what that holds and work yourself into the discussion to get um, you know to, to make sure we're, we're we're in line where we ought to be with respect to reimbursement on Medicaid we will thank you thank you guys and, and like your predecessor service boards um, thank you for everything you do and your cooperation it's deeply appreciated no other questions thank you very much Thank you. In an effort to finish the budget issues, why don't we do the RTA budget, agency budget, item 3B next. B? Oh, Bill. Okay. So Bill Ackman will be presenting our RTA agency budget.
That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Good morning. Um, as Director McGallis said, I'm going to now present an overview, an overview of the proposed 2018 RTA agency budget. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the assistance of my staff, particularly uh, my colleague Nora Buya, who has day-to-day -day responsibilities concerning the RTA agency budget, both developing that budget in the fall and monitoring that budget throughout the year. As a reminder, uh, this item is presented for discussion purposes only, like the other budgets presented today. No actions being requested at this time. Um, as with the other budgets presented earlier this morning, the board will consider for adoption the RTA agency budget, along with the service board budgets, as part of the proposed 2018 RTA Consolidated Regional Business Plan. Again this year, the RTA followed a priority-based budgeting approach. The budget was developed uh, in keeping with the five-year regional strategic plan adopted by the RTA board in August of 2013. This approach aligns the agency's budget with the RTA's mission within the region. The proposed 2018 RTA agency budget totals $34.3 million. This chart depicts the portion of the RTA agency budget supported by regional funding from the RTA sales tax. We also call this the net operating budget because it reflects expenses less associated revenue and outside funding. Here we compare the proposed 2018 administrative and regional programs budgets to the 2017 revised RTA budget. The, the administrative budget decreases by 1.1% or $178,000, and the regional programs budget increases by 1.8% or $300,000. So the total proposed 2018 RTA agency net operating budget of $33.2 million is expected to increase by only 0.4% from the revised 2017 agency budget. Also, I'd like to mention that total agency headcount is budgeted at the same level in 2018 as in 2017. All right. So in 2018, budgeted funding and revenues totaled $34.3 million, as shown in the pie chart on the left. Of that amount, 96.9%, or $33.2 million, represents regional public funding from the RTA sales tax. The remaining 3.1%, or $1.1 million, includes grants and other revenues. Budgeted agency expenses, shown on the right, also totaled $34.3 million. Administrative costs account for 48.4%, or $16.6 million. Regional services account for 48%, or $16.4 million. Grant and RTA-funded projects account for the remaining 3.6%, or $1.2 million. And for these projects, the RTA acts both as an advocate and granting agency, receiving the funds for the region and then administering grants to the service boards, counties, and municipalities. The proposed RTA agency budget is developed in two parts, administration and regional programs. The administrative budget includes expenses for personnel, professional services, information technology, facilities, office services that support the funding, planning, and oversight mission of the RTA. In 2018, the proposed administrative budget accounts for 48.4% of agency expenses, 
or $16.6 million. This amount is 33.7% below the 2018 statutory administrative cap of $25 million allowed by the RTA Act. The proposed 2018 regional program's budget supports services provided to the public. These services include ADA paratransit certification, mobility management and travel training, the customer service centers, the free and reduced fare and transit benefit programs, and grant and RTA funded projects and programs. The regional programs also include the RTA's grant funded projects, as I said, for regional studies and initiatives such as transit oriented development, access to transit, and community planning assistance. The proposed regional programs budget accounts for the remaining 51.6% or $17.7 .7 million of the 2018 agency expenses. All right, so the next couple of slides highlight some of the programs and projects included in the 2018 agency budget. The RTA will issue a $150 million capital bond to support the service board capital programs. The agency will also issue a $150 million two-year working cash note to help manage state funding delays. The RTA will complete the procurement and begin the implementation of an Integrated Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP, system to replace our current ERP system and various shadow and manual systems used to support RTA business processes. In conjunction with the CTA, Metra, PACE, the Illinois Department of Transportation, and the Illinois Toll Highway Authority, the RTA will host the annual Transportation Symposium with a new format that fosters business relationships between prime vendors, subcontractors, and, and joint venture partners, and alerts the market to potential business opportunities with these agencies, focusing on disadvantaged business enterprises. Also in 2018, the RTA will recommend board adoption of the 2018-2013 Regional Transit Plan and begin working towards implementing that plan. The RTA will continue installing interagency signs in strategic locations throughout the region to assist riders whose transit travel involves more than one service board. The agency will maintain and enhance the RTA Maps and Statistics Data Warehouse website that provides planning and financial information about our transit system and also allows users to access transit and related data through interactive maps. The RTA will administer the community planning and federal 5310 programs that assist private, nonprofit groups in meeting the transportation needs of older adults and people with disabilities. The agency will also implement a new older adult travel training program to help seniors feel more confident riding fixed route transit service. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to address any questions. Any questions or comments about the budget? On the uh, proposed salary uh, adjustments as far as the percentage base, is that in keeping with what the other service boards are doing? Do you know? Yes. Um, I, you know, it's a merit-based, and it's 3%. Um, and our plan is to be consistent with what the, the other service boards are doing. And the headcount is the same at 114, like you mentioned. From it's a budgeted headcount of 114, but we actually only have 101 staffed positions at this time. Any other? Yes, uh, Director Higgins. I just uh, want to commend you for um, putting forward a budget that spends only 0.45% more than 2017 actual. Um, that's uh, less than a quarter of the rate of inflation. And thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, um, we'll be voting on it at the next next board meeting. 
Uh, with that, we need to th thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, we'll move on to the last item under finance, which is the resolution certifying the third quarter financial results. B? So um, this, Doug will be joining me up here. So uh, it's a little bit, we're going a little bit opposite direction, but we do have to go back to 2017. And, and 2017, uh, this particular month, will be uh, a little bit different because uh, as we committed to you, once you revise the funding uh, forecast, oh, it's Eva, sorry, Eva. Um, once we revise the funding forecast for all of us, um, we did say we would present uh, what I'm calling a dual dashboard to be more transparent and show you how the actual results are comparing to the reforecasted amount so you can see both. But keep in mind that we will actually have to certify against the original funding amounts because those are the ones that were adopted by the board. Uh, so for purposes of the state, so we'll do that for the remaining months uh, in the 2017 and then we'll be back to normal in 2018, okay? So today we will review the year-to-date financial results through September 2017. Revenue continues to be impacted by lower ridership, the reduction in state funding for reduced fare programs, and the weakening sales tax growth. Uh, still, the service board's expense performance has been strong and we saw a net result for the region uh, continue to improve through the third quarter. Before we continue with the results versus budgets, um, we'd like to give you an update on the 2017 reforecast. Uh, I already talked about all this, let me skip around. Collectively, in response to the 3.9% decrease in funding, the service board's reforecasts uh, reduced 2017 ridership and operating revenue by 3.2% and operating expenses by 2.9% or 79 million relative to the adopted 2017 budgets. These adjustments were generally consistent with the year-to-date trends through August. Uh, the Metro Pace Suburban and 88 paratransit reforecasts were balanced, meaning that those agencies were able to absorb the funding and revenue losses with ongoing uh, cost savings. CTA was most heavily hit by the almost 50% cut in reduced fare funding from the state and expects to finish 2017 with a 17.5 million negative net result. As you heard earlier, they're going to be uh, taking on a line of credit for 25 million and 17.5 million of that will be their first draw and that will be for this 2017 uh, budget. And again, that depends on the final PBV. They may be able to do less than that. Um, here we're going to the reforecast now. We've created a parallel dashboard which shows actual results versus the 2017 reforecast. You'll notice the lack of highlights, which is a good thing. Essentially, this view will tell us that the service boards are holding to the reforecast that we provided. So far, this is true for ridership, operating revenue, operating expense, where the largest unfavorable variance is only 0.4%. One area of concern shown here uh, outside of the service board's control is that our recent sales tax and PTF results, and again, the PTF results um, are falling short, um, and we'll explain why in a little bit, begin to fall short of even the amended amount by about 1%. And this is in part due to the state taking the 2% surcharge and the PTF 10% reduction earlier than anticipated. As we've discussed, um, the uh, two per, you know, normally when there's a surcharge applied, uh, it begins post that period, right? So uh, we were anticipating that it would begin with the July sales tax. Instead, the 2% uh, surcharge, surcharge began um, earlier, and it applied to when we began receiving it, not for the month in which it was actually incurred. Uh, the same thing with the PTF. So... We expected this 2% uh, sales surcharge to begin in July and the 10% PTF reduction to begin in October because, again, it would have been for the month of July, which isn't paid out until October. Uh, however, the October PTF is calculated on the July sales tax and the 2% surcharge began two months earlier with the May sales tax um, and the PTF three months earlier with the July PTF. This amounts to approximately four million less sales tax and 10 million less PTF, um, or a total of 14 million less funding in 2017. Assuming the PTF reduction is temporary, we should receive three months or 10 million more 
PTF in 2018 than budgeted. But but again, you heard the service board's comment. We, we will see how that's applied. That's assuming it doesn't continue into the 2018 state fiscal uh, budget year. Um, We'll show this second dashboard at each of the board meetings for the rest of this year's results. Keep in mind uh, that the quarterly certifications, we're doing it against the adopted budget. So now let's go back to the other dashboard. Um, so system ridership through September was 3.2% lower than budget, as shown by the orange bars on this chart. Ridership has been down each month from prior year, and total ridership is down 3.3% from 2016. Going back to the summary table, each service board uh, reported ridership results below the budgeted levels. As indicated by the red boxes, Pace Suburban service ridership was 6.6% unfavorable to budget, and 88 paratransit ridership was 4.4% unfavorable. The Suburban service and 88 budget results both assumed ridership gains for 2017, but both services have thus far had ridership flat to prior year. CTA ridership is also highlighted in red with total ridership 3.3% unfavorable to budget and both bus and rail ridership down relative to prior year. So now let's look at operating revenue. It was 15.2 million or 1.8% unfavorable to budget. The shortfall is due to the combined effect of unfavorable fare revenue and the lower level of reduced fare reimbursement anticipated in the state budget. CTA has been most heavily impacted by the reduction in reduced fare funding, while Pace Suburban Service has the largest fare revenue shortfall due to lagging ridership. Both are highlighted in red. ADA paratransit operating revenue was 7.9% unfavorable, also highlighted due to the lower ridership uh, delayed state payment of Medicaid reimbursements, but as we pointed out earlier, we're expecting it to come in, but we don't know for certain, and lower reimbursements for RTA certification trips. Now looking at public funding, it shows a shortfall from budget of 3.6% for the region with unfavorable results for both CTA and Metro. This includes our initial projection of August sales tax, which was 1.1% com uh, compared to prior oh, year. Real, est real estate transfer tax results receipts have also uh, been underperforming budget this far by 2.8%. On a brighter note, system-wide operating expenses through September were $51.4 million, or 2.5% favorable to budget, with CTA Metro and Pace Suburban reporting favorable results, a key aspect of their 2017 forecast. CTA had a 3.1 favorable to budget expense performance highlighted in light blue due to favorable results in each category, fuel, injuries, and damages, and other expenses. Pace Suburban Service also had a 3.1 favorable to budget expense performance highlighted in light blue to, again to uh, primarily to maintenance and administration savings of 2.3 million each. Um, looking at the regional level, the favorable operating expenses were not strong enough to offset the unfavorable operating revenue and public funding, producing a net result which was 4.6 million unfavorable to budget, but a significant improvement of the 17 million that we reported at last quarter's uh, report. So through September, the regional recovery ratio is favorable to budget by 0 0.8 percentage points and it has risen above the 50% um, for the year. This is a marked improvement from the first quarter when the board, um, at our recommendation, found the region to be not in substantial accordance with the budget. So the fair revenue recovery ratio of 36.2 includes passenger fair revenue only, and that is up 1.1 percentage points from last quarter. When you look at ancillary service board revenue, the recovery ratio increases to 42.1% for the year to date, an improvement of 1.5 percentage points from last quarter's report. In the right section, we call the statutory recovery ratio of 50.4, and it's labeled with credits. CTA Metro's recovery ratios are favorable to budget, while ADA Paratransit's recovery ratio is on par with budget, and Pace Suburban serv Service is still unfavorable due to their operating revenue shortfall. In summary, the good news is that the service board's operating recovery Operating revenue and expense results continue to improve such that the regional recovery ratio is on track to make the year-end 50% uh, requirement. 
Uh, the bad news is that year-to-date ridership performance continues to negatively impact operating revenue at the same time that public funding is underperforming. Uh, despite the revenue shortfalls, CTA Metro and PACE and PACE ADA were able to maintain lower expenses through September, resulting in operating deficits that were favorable to budget or within the criteria uh, for awarding the uh, insubstantial accordance. The ADA paratransit operating deficit has improved from 4.9 unfavorable through the second quarter to 2.8 unfavorable uh, through the third quarter. Therefore, we are recommending that the board find each of the service boards in substantial accordance with budget through the third quarter. Uh, that concludes my remarks. I would be happy to answer any questions. Back to the comment about the, the state taking um, the allocation of 2% earlier than we thought. What did the state law say? I mean, we should clearly understand when it became effective and when it was going to be So, charged. So I had overseen 40 different city taxes, and I had never seen that before. So um, we have been working with Jeremy, and, and Nadine is primed to answer, but, but that is unusual. Usually it's not retroactive. So... I don't want to give away too much, but my assumption is that the Department of Revenue does, doesn't consider that collection period to be retroactive. Exactly. They're, they process, are looking they're at processing it, process it after the effective date. We have a valid argument in the opposite direction. So. I mean, is that something we're going to challenge, or are we just going to go with it? We're certainly discussing it. Th think about how that's hitting all the municipalities, well, sure. the city of Chicago. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes. Director uh, be, be on the recovery ratio, I know we've talked about this a lot. Um, you, this is through the third quarter, and I think your projections are that at the end of the year we'll likely be able to meet that standard. But the way we met the standard was by expense reduction. So my question is, that's not a sustainable strategy. And as we go forward into the next fiscal year, uh, are there concerns about the ability to comply with that ratio based on what we had to do to get there thus far? So uh, the good news is, uh, after a lot of you know negotiations with the service boards, uh, we were not able to get them to increase what it was from this year. However, all three of them, and it's in the budget books, um, <laughs> All three of them came in higher, like 1% to 2% over what they had agreed to. So the good news is that they are all projecting higher uh, recovery ratios, although uh, they weren't mandated to do it in the budget. You know, we, we agreed to keep them the same, but they've all come in 1% to 2% higher. So we should be fine as long as they're, they're meeting those uh, recovery ratios. But, but they're meeting the recovery ratios through expense reduction by and large because the funding side of the equation all seems to be down and the ridership is down. So I'm just trying to make sure. It, but they it, all increase fares. Okay, That's so going to be the deciding factor. Okay. They yeah. all increase fares. Got it. Other questions or comments? If not, could we have a motion and a second to approve? Motion by Director Lewis, second by Director Melvin. All in favor signify by saying we, we need a roll. A uh, roll call. Director Anderson? Yes. Director Colson? Yes. Director DeWitt? Yes. Director Cotel? Aye. Director Lewis? Yes. Director Melvin? Yes. Director McGallis? Aye. Seven ayes and one absent? Great. And I believe that's everything on this agenda, so motion.